Good morning, everyone. So I have a couple of announcements. Uh, first, on the schedule for December, um, we have today's meeting, and then where we're going to hear from our ACO benchmark um, presentation, we'll hear from the recommendations from uh, our ACO APM team on recommendations on the 2021 care budget. Next um, Tuesday, the 17th, announce that I want to announce that the Rural Health Services Task Force will be meeting at 9 a.m. and that's in this room, Robin. I mean this building, fourth floor, fourth floor room, upstairs. Yep. And then on Wednesday, December 18th, we'll have our regularly scheduled board meeting starting at 1 p.m. in this room. We will have the Green Mountain here uh, the. Uh, one care ACO budget with a potential vote and then our analytics team is going to present uh, our proposed research and re reporting priorities for 2020 to 2022. I also want to make a uh, clarification on today's agenda. As I said, we're going to first hear from uh, Sarah Lindbergh on our ACO Medicare bench benchmark proposal. We have listed a potential vote, but we will not be voting today. We are awaiting additional clarification on some data from our federal partners. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. Next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, November 20th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, November 20th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So now we're going to move to the ACO uh, benchmark proposal and welcome Sarah Lindberg to come forward. I'm so stressed out and I have to operate one of these. <laughs> Bear with me. Good morning, Sarah Lindberg, Health Services Researcher with the Green Mountain Care Board. As Susan already said, uh, the proposed vote today will have to be delayed uh, due to some data lags and, and uh, refreshes that are going to be required to finalize the benchmark. Uh, however, I thought it would still be prudent to just go over uh, some assumptions and sensitivity analyses as they relate to the Medicare benchmark for our all-payer model financial targets. So uh, among other things, whenever uh, we propose a benchmark, the agreement says that we have to meet certain conditions in order for that benchmark to be approved by CMS. And there's the most pressing on my mind are these two financial targets. So whatever benchmark we set must enable us to meet two different financial targets. And these are all pair models, statewide agreement deals, not just ACO deals. So it's a broader lens than just the ACO budget. So we have to say that whatever benchmark we're re we, that we propose will allow us to meet our all-payer total cost of care growth target, which is 3.5% or less, compounded over five years. So that's from 2017 to 2022. But that we would need to show that we're kind of on track to meet that goal in order to sell the proposal um, successfully. I mean, sell is a strong word. To have a, a proposal successfully approved by our federal partners. We also have to make sure that we're keeping our total cost of care growth 0.2 percentage points at, at a minimum below the national projection. So that's where that call letter and the budget kind of tread rate that guardrails come from. That part I think we're probably more familiar with than how this folds into the all-payer statewide idea. So just kind of helps me to put into context how people and spending aren't the same thing when you're looking at this stuff. So if you look at our um, statewide uh, total cost of care estimated uh, for through, with three months of runout in 2018, Medicare represents 44% of the spend, even though it's 27% of the people. So they have kind of a, a high, um, higher influence uh, per person than other payers. Um, it's a little bit more congruent for commercial um, and again, this is just data available to us in our all-payer claims database, so that's an important caveat. But of that subset of information, it's 44% of the people and 40% of the spend in the commercial market. 
and then Medicaid, while they have 29% of the people as their primary payer, it represents 16% of the spend. Another caveat is that this is total cost of care spending, so right out of the gate we're excluding about half the Medicaid spend for the total cost of care because that is excluded from our um, total cost of care as defined by the all-payer model agreement. So there's certain things like we said, hey, we're already doing pretty cool stuff with home-based community services and mental health. Let's not mess with that anymore. <laughs> Let's just keep it kind of Medicare A and B type services. So that's why the Medicaid spend is kind of cut in half for the agreement purposes. Um, so when we look at what was budgeted by the ACO for 2020, um, you can see that, again, the, the slopes are similar, but a little bit more dramatic in some cases. So the commercial as budgeted is pretty much one to one, 41% of the budgeted number of people they expect to attribute and 40% of the expected spend. Um, but here's where it gets a little more disproportionate. Medicaid represents 37% of the budgeted attributed lives and 21% of their budgeted expected spend. Um, and then Medicare, again, we see that kind of dramatic slope where even though it's only 22% of the attributed lives they budgeted, it's 40% of their spend. All this is to say, and I've said this all along, this thing's probably gonna go the way Medicare goes. It's, it's, that's the kind of the, the most influential point as more and more people are aging onto Medicare, that's what I think this model's really gonna hinge on. And that's why I think that setting the Medicare benchmark is a really important thing to focus on when we're considering the obligations for the all-payer spend. And stop me along the line if, if you have any questions. <laughs> I do have a question. Um, when you're talking about the Medicaid percentage going down, right, mm -hmm. being a lower percent than population, and part of it you said was because some of the services are provided elsewhere, but isn't it really the benchmark number because it's so low, PMPM, PM, so it's like a 200 and something number versus a 800 for Medicare. Exactly. You're talking about kind of this percent. Yeah, so that percentage, yeah, exactly. I'm saying. Is so it's, it's less money per person. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge part of it. Right. But this wouldn't be quite as dramatic if this were times two. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> for right. a full picture of Medicaid spending. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and so these are, you know, it's pretty hard to project the future, um, but just kind of looking at very high level. So we feel pretty good about where we think 2018 is landing. Again, this is for the all payers, statewide, whether or not you're attributed to the ACO, these are the, all the folks that we're accountable for, for our spending when we talk to the federal government. And you'll see right away, we've got a problem. This is not right. <laughs> this number is not gonna be 0.5% after we get our data right. So that's, that's not a good number to be anchoring on. So right now we're predicting the commercial growth to be 0.5%. Um, that largely has to do with some, some um, problems we're getting fixed with the data feed from our largest, uh, a large commercial insurer. And so that's gonna probably go up closer to what we've historically seen in the five to 6% range. So, um, so that, that's built into these assumptions when I'm projecting forward, but I just wanna be transparent that um, we know that we have a bad estimate there. Um, so as it stands, um, the Medicaid growth is pretty dramatic from 17 to 18. So we're observing, this is without any adjustments for um, price increases. This is a 7% growth rate that we're seeing from 17 to 18 statewide where Medicaid is the primary payer. So this is um, you know, something that uh, our partners over at uh, Medicaid are aware of and are starting to investigate. Some things that we see in our data are there are changes in the amount of utilization by the Medicaid population and also the type of utilization. So the big one is acute inpatient hospitalizations are up and also that might also be where they're getting hospitalized is has a higher unit cost. So there's a lot of stuff that's going into this 7%, but that's a statewide Medicaid thing. Um, I think one thing that is really important to be aware of is that for the ACO, the base year was 17. So their 19 par target's probably pretty lousy for them. Um, and I think that, that that'll be adjusted because um, from early indications, it doesn't look like this growth rate is likely to continue into 2018, uh, 2019. Um, but you know, it's still early, hard to say for sure where that might land. Um, and then for Medicare, so, uh, these are allowed amounts. That's another important thing to keep in mind. 
this will include the you know 20 ish percent cost share that is um, borne by the member so the numbers you see with the ACO budget are paid amount so that would just be the amount that Medicare is on the hook for so through um, 2018 with that three months of run out we see a growth rate of 1.8 percent again statewide that includes people who just have only part A of Medicare or only part B um, it's a much different population than where it is in the mix when we're talking about the ACO population. Um, that's likely to go up a little bit with three months of additional run out. So that puts our um, all payer growth rate at 2.6%. Um, back of the envelope, we think that probably will ra land right around 3.5 with that additional three months of run out and the correction for the commercial market spend. So if we were to kind of project out some low growth and high growth scenarios, um, I see, you know, the, the probable range between 3.1% and 4.9%, that would be compounding annualized growth from 17 to 20. So that's what we're on the hook for. So that's say, what's the spend in 2020, divide that by 17, take that to the number, the, the third power, and that's the, a, the annualized growth rate that, that I'm projecting. If I look at the most likely scenario, um, I think we're probably 4.3. That number is important because if we were ex to exceed that, that's when we get in big trouble for sure with our federal partners. Again, all payer, system-wide growth. Um, that's assuming that our statewide Medicare growth, um, is, it's been pretty stable at 2.2%, so that would be making the assumption that that um, assumption were to continue. If we assume that the state grows at the max, what the national is projecting, everybody does, um, that's when we get a 3.3% trend rate. And due to this slide, when this goes up, it affects this a lot more than when this goes up. <laughs> so when Medicaid goes up, the bottom line isn't as sensitive just because it's less dollars. Even if it's more people, it's fewer dollars, and that's why the, the all payer is less sensitive to that. Sorry, I'm trying to keep clear. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. I mean, there are lots of numbers, and I think yeah. people are not, um, you know, clear on everything. Can you talk about where 2019, like, you know, we're going, we have 18, we have 20. Yeah, so We don't 19, have 19 in the mix, just to explain why yeah, that's sure. not in there. And um, so, I, so the reason I don't have the 19 data published is I don't have um, 19 data available yet. So I'm just extrapolating from other data sources. So I wanted to keep the data source consistent. Um, but uh, from what I've seen for early 19, um, I think that uh, Medicaid looks within that range. Um, maybe would go as high as 300 um, is one possible projection I've seen. Um, commercial is the hardest one to project, um, but I'd say, you know, that 6% has been kind of the average growth over the past five years. So I would expect long-term the 6% growth rate is pretty, pretty um, stable. Uh, and then uh, Medicare, uh, the 2019 numbers, we're just starting to um, look at the information here, but statewide, um, I just don't have enough information to be sure where that's landing for sure, but I haven't seen any evidence that statewide we're likely to exceed that kind of 2.2% trend, so. And I guess where I'm going is, you know, you talked at the beginning about the 3.5%. So yeah. on a, con you know, compounded five year, we're not to exceed 3.5 is the target. And then you mentioned the 4.3. Can you just talk a little bit about what the 4.3 triggers? Sure, yeah. So the difference between 3.5 and 4.3, so um, as Robin has educated me from her experience in the negotiation is um, it really depends on the economic picture that you use to project kind of inflation-driven growth. So lousy economic projection was 3.5%, economies growing slower healthier economic perspective was a 4.3%. So that's why they said, well, let's say that you're not gonna get in trouble unless you exceed 4.3%. So that's the trigger for corrective action at our federal level. That said, um, there's a lot of latitude in the language of the agreement so that um, they could, I don't think that that number is chiseled in stone. So if okay. we are showing they're not on track, they have the latitude to start a corrective action. Okay. And can I just jump in on that point? So to Sarah's point, the targets were set from prior economic growth. Uh, those don't get recalculated based on new economic growth, just to clarify that point. And um, I think 
I personally would not characterize the 4.3 as big trouble. Sorry, Sarah. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, it, it is a technical uh, part of the agreement that would allow the feds to choose to come to us and say, okay, we want to dig into why your growth rate is exceeding economic, the previous economic forecast. Let's investigate what's going on. That could result in some modifications to the agreement. It could result in nothing happening. So I think it basically triggers a negotiation and a review. There you go. That's much fairer characterization. Sorry to be a <laughs> no, no, it's okay. alarmist. Any other questions about this? Okay. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Just a quick one. Uh, so that 4.3% is a, uh, um, is that, that's the trend rate? going back to 2017? Yeah, that would be the average, yeah, based on what I think, given my very limited information, what I consider the best estimate for the projected growth, which is worth about as what this slide's printed out. <laughs> okay, no, hard to on that one. Um, so yeah, so again, just, um, just to remind people that that national growth is the other portion of the, um, financial target that we have to make sure that we're meeting when we propose a benchmark. And that's where these annual kind of ceilings for the trend rate used in the growth rate come from. So that would be the um, uh, you know, 3.96 for the non-ESRD and the 2.94 for the ESRD population. So, so that one's kind of the easier one to demonstrate clearly that we're fulfilling if we're using these national projections and use trend rates that are in line with those. I think it's much harder to untangle the all payer part of our obligation. So, um, so that's just some background about why we're recommending a trend rate of 3.5% for the non-ESRD trend rate. Um, so an important thing happened. Uh, so there was an error in the calculation of the number of prospectively aligned beneficiaries for Medicare. Uh, the an inaccurate provider list was provi was produced to the people who run that, that process. And so that means that um, one good thing is that this number feels a lot more reasonable um, to everyone because the 19 and 20 networks are so similar, um, we would expect the number to be similar. Instead, it had gone up by 20,000 people. And after a lot of investigation, we it came to light that, the, that this was based on the wrong provider list. So um, as a placeholder, for this recommendation today, I'm just using the prospective attribution from 2019. That's not exactly what it'll be. It'll be a little bit different. Um, hard to say if it's up or down. Um, likely it'll go down by a few hundred people if, if my um, estimates are any uh, guide. Um, and then we also have a current updated estimate um, to, our, the, to, to date of what we think the base experience is. So the, the upshot is that both these numbers are still being worked out exactly. So. This is the estimate for the 19 experience, the estimated attribution for 2020, and then here's that 3.5% um, trend rate. So as we saw on the previous slide, we could go as high as 3.9 and fulfill the Medicare obligation under our agreement. Um, every time you increase the, the, this trend rate by point, a tenth of a percentage point, so if this goes up to 3.6%, the benchmark would grow by $582,000 and some change. Um, and the PM, PM would go up by 83 cents. So the, the amount the benchmark will change will be sensitive to both these numbers. The PM, PM will only be sensitive to this number. But based on our current estimate, it would increase it by 83 cents. So that trickles through not 100%, but a great, most of that increase goes right to the all payer because even though the scale, so for instance in 2018, even though the Medicare um, scale only represented j just under 30% of the Medicare lives, it was 48% of the spending in, in 2018. So the ACO, people who get attributed are more expensive, they are utilizers. So when you are attributed, so the ACO spend 
kind of market share is greater than its people market share. So we often think of scale in terms of people, but there's also kind of a spending scale. And so that, um, you know, 80 cents or whatever is going to probably about 60 cents of that is going to trickle through. So I, I apologize, I shouldn't have rounded there. It's not a full dollar. It's, um, it, it's about um, 64 cents is how it would um, contribute to the all-payer growth. And every two percentage points that that goes up, makes this number go up by a tenth of a percent. <coughs> so to say that another way, if we were to use 3.7% instead of 3.5, I would guess this would be 4.4%. So if we, try, if we were to just increase the ACO's benchmark by 0.2% points, so 3.7 instead of 3.9, my estimate is that this would go up to 4.4%. So on that, flip back one. Nope. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the problem. Yes. Right there. <laughs> yes. So on the uh, 58,575, it's accurate to say, wouldn't it be that we would take the current attributed lives, add a couple of FQHC practices that are coming online, subtract Springfield, and subtract deaths, and that would give us the number? Uh, not the deaths, because we start fresh every year. They're just okay. gone. Yep, we, we always take live people, yeah. Um, so yeah, so, then and then know. every year new people are turning on to Medicare. So. That's true. Yeah. And you'd have to adjust it for utilization. Correct. So, if, so all those providers, but then if those folks haven't utilized services, then they're not attributed, even if they're going to a ACO provider. Yeah, the good news about the error is that there were some providers that were, um, from what I understand, added pretty late that they were not able to include for the attribution last time. So this time we'll be able to include them. So we're, we're ho really hopeful that attribution will be pretty steady across the two years, despite the loss of Springfield from the network. What do you estimate the margin of error could be on that number? Oh, golly. Um, that is not an ounce I specifically did, but um, when I just looked at um, the data available to me and I looked at 19 uh, and 20, I think I lost about 300 people. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be super material to, um, I mean, it's certainly material, but I think getting this number right is critical um, if we know that we're dealing with the right population. So but it's very be, likely that it will not change the analysis. The analysis, uh, oh, the 3.5 is, you know, that I think, you know, even if, you know, if this, if this is not the right number and needs to go up, we'll have to live with that. But um, I'm real worried that that we're putting ourselves in, in some behind the eight ball in terms of meeting our obligations. But or, you know, having the opportunity to revisit the targets, that's another way to frame it. They would yep. really hasten that conversation. Okay. Can I just, I just want to make sure I understand what you just said. Um, on that chart there, because I yep. think this is a really important chart, and your best estimate column is really important to the extent that really what we're looking at is the all-payer total cost of care at 4.3. And what I think I just heard you say was if we hold constant the Medicaid growth at, say, 3.3%, which is your best estimate, we hold constant the commercial growth at 6%, um, which is your best estimate, and Medicare, if you were to allow, for example, the 3.9, which uh, we are to some degree allowed to do and still hold our all-payer model agreement because it's 0.2% below the call letter. But if we were to do that, that would get our all-payer total cost of care to 4.5%. Is that your? That's my. Which would be above the corrective action sort of trigger. Yeah, and okay. so and then so the other kind of piece of it is this is something we present to CMS for them to approve or deny, and. <coughs> I don't. I, I just have a hard time seeing how we could get an approval for something that would knowingly um, exceed our corrective action target. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, and then <laughs> nobody cares about the ESRD, but they're always here. And so again. Uh, because of the call letter, the maximum allowable trend rate there is 2.9%. So um, this is a very expensive population, which also means it's highly volatile. So as much as we can help protect against that risk for this population, you know, I'm, I'm all for that. It ends up not being a ton of 
um, dollars proportionally to the full benchmark, but um, it is a very expensive subpopulation and, and one that um, requires a lot of intense uh, care and uh, management and coordination. So, um, you know, that's that's a target that we want to get right if we can, or at least we've got headroom there. <laughs> um, and then uh, we continue to strongly advocate um, that we allow the blueprint and sash dollars to continue to be um, distributed in advance um, to help with cash flow and funding these important programs. Uh, I got some late breaking news yesterday where we think that that 8.2 might look more like 8.4 based on the current attribution. So we're actively talking to our federal partners about um, making that change. I'm optimistic that they'll, I mean, they, they get the value of this program and and certainly want to support it. So, um, but that, so um, that's another number that wouldn't necessarily be formal uh, finalized here. So, <laughs> uh, so essentially, none of these numbers are final. I just realized, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is our best estimate for the base experience. Our best estimate for the prospectively aligned populations. Our recommended trend rate for you to vote on next Wednesday. Our best estimate for the base ESRD experience, best estimate for the prospective attribution, our recommended trend rate uh, going forward, and then that blueprint money, which may change a little bit. So um, that would lead the, the actual benchmark to be much closer to what was budgeted. And again, on a PM, PM basis, we're very close, but um, the main difference is that uh, these numbers have come uh, back to reality, essentially. So that uh, mysterious 20,000 lives that no one could figure out where they're coming from shouldn't have been there. So we're going to get that right. Um, and that's part of the reason we asked to delay the vote so that we can have a little bit more confidence about this um, final number before you guys vote. Can you just clarify why the 8.2 went to 8.4 and how it relates to attribution? Sure. Um, so <laughs> just like we're always talking about different three fives, different attributions. So the blueprint attribution program is a separate process. And so these dollars don't necessarily go to one care folks. This is funding a program that's bigger than the one care network. So um, that is why um, they, you know, they did their best to guess what it might be. But then on top of that, there's some inflationary adjustments to the blueprint rate. So those two things together kind of made it go up a little bit. But you know, kind of a, <laughs> but these numbers are a little close to a drop in the bucket. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I'm not sure I understood the answer sure. to the question. Is there a simple equation that calculates that 8.4? Yes, there is. I can share that, certainly. Okay. I, I'm simple as probably. There's an equation I can share, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I would just, the one thing I would just chime in about the blueprint stuff is one of the benefits of the model was, A, continuing the Medicare contribution to blueprint and SASH, but also having a trend rate uh, prior to, that, to this model in the original agreement with Medicare, it was a flat amount and it did not change. So that is a, a benefit. Yeah, that is a really, um, that's one of the nice things about having a state model is to have that kind of flexibility. Um, another real nice part about the state flexibility is that um, for a standard next gen program, 3% of this has to be at risk for quality which is a, a big number. Um, that's a lot of dollars that are at risk for quality, but um, because it's a, our state agreement, we're able to keep that at 0.5% again in 2020. We'll have to start increasing that, but I think we'll have the flexibility to make it more gradual and um, you know, true to the program. Oh, and the only other thing I would say is that um, when you're thinking about these PMPMs, um, so they, they aren't necessarily directly comparable to previous years, and, and that's another thing that we're trying to do to help add um, some sustainability and predictability to the model is that um, in previous years, these numbers would have changed at settlement, but we're trying to have a number that stays the same prospectively as it is at settlement, so you always know what your true target is. And so um, that will already take out some adjustments. And we actually included um, an additional adjustment for some uh, high cost inpatient expenses. So there's, um, if you're a particularly complex inpatient case for Medicare, you get an outlier payment. So we've taken that out. So if you were to have an influx of those high cases, high cost cases, um, you know, th that would add a little bit additional risk protection for those events. Other questions for Sarah? 
Okay, we'll open it up to public comment. Am I missing anybody? Ham. Hey, There's no chance the public gets this. Zero. <laughs> Do you get it? Nope. You? Yes. You understand all of this? Only because I've had remedial classes. <laughs> I haven't had the remedial classes. <laughs> Let's just say that this is a, a really important function that um, we've got to get right. We can't get the wrong number or we're, we're placing um, the reform efforts in uh, jeopardy. And it's something that's keeping us up at night as we try to make sure that we get the correct information. And that's been a struggle. Can I make a comment? Sure. You explain that to me and I can explain it to the public and neither you nor she can. What, what part can't you? I mean, I've just seen it for the first time, so it's just a blizzard. I, 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 if I had, it would take at least probably an hour and a half to two hours with Sarah to disassemble that and turn it into English. I got nothing but time, right? <laughs> so I think that Sarah would graciously agree yeah. to give you an hour and a half of uh, time. Better act fast. My parental leave starts next Friday. <laughs> <laughs> December 20th. Is and we're going to really miss her, too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, in the back. In the states which don't have a regulatory function such as free medical care board, how effective are they at keeping health care costs down? In other words, if we remove our regulatory influence, are we doing anything? In other words, when we compare our health care expenditures maybe to New Hampshire, which might not have a free medical care board, how, how do their expenditures compare with ours? Are, are they keeping their costs down? I think they would, they would argue that they're attempting to. They do um, try to do things. Um, they, they try to tout that there's no regulatory authority, but for example, things like the Attorney General's office there through the Charitable Trust Division um, tries to exert oversight over hospital acquisitions and mergers and things like that. Um, I think that if you look at the traditional growth in healthcare spending pre-Green Mountain Care Board and after Green Mountain Care Board, you have seen a decline in the growth and total healthcare spending in the state of Vermont. But keep in mind that the Green Mountain Care Board only has um, influence over half of the healthcare spending in the state. Other questions or comments? Yes. I would just like to join this <laughs> one and a half hour. So uh, my name is Bob Zila Fitford. So if that's ever set up, just let me know the time. And if it's OK, I'd like to join that. Can you uh, give your contact information to Sarah? Sure. OK. Anyone else? Could be quite a party. Anybody else want to join? <laughs> OK. Thank you, Sarah. It, it is very difficult to uh, understand. And I know you've tried to make it easier for us um, non-math geeks to uh, get everything, but it takes time. And um, Mr. Chair, we will accept public written comments up until we vote next week. OK. So with that, we're going to transition to the staff recommendations on the OCV budget and invite uh, our team to come forward.
Uh, we would like to keep questions for the end, but if there are any clarifying questions you may have um, along the way, just because there are 100 slides that we are going to try to get through as efficiently as possible, we wanted to kind of provide the public with as much detail as we can and, and the board some background, so um, <coughs> let's just keep that in mind and work with us. Thank you. Um, so today we'll talk, we'll give some background on the ACO oversight process. We'll review public comment that we've received to date. Um, we'll go through the certification eligibility verification. Uh, the budget review, we'll have a number of um, key topics to address there. And then we'll summarize the recommendations that we will have presented throughout the presentation, um, identify next steps and take questions, or robust questions in public comment. Uh, we do want to, you know, we've heard this conversation about acronyms and all the acronyms. We did not take the acronyms out because we wanted to try to keep a simple presentation, but there's a list, this list you'll find printed for your convenience at the front, um, and we'll kind of work to make this a standard product and perhaps build a glossary at some point for public consumption. So that's fine to have the list, yes. and it's fine to, to try to make it easier to read the slides to use the acronyms, but when you speak, Please try to be acronym yes. free. We will do our best. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, so this slide we just presented recently, so it might be familiar to you um, why we have the all payment model to begin with. Um, there was a problem that, that the state was aiming to solve to reduce the, to control the cost of growth in healthcare um, while maintaining <coughs> quality um, of healthcare for Vermonters. Uh, the strategy was too pronged to um, all, to reshape the care delivery system um, through payment reform, um, and the ACO was seen as the, as the vehicle to affect that change. So this was the logic model that kind of coincides with this strategy. Um, so population-based payments that are tied to quality and outcomes, increased investment in primary care and prevention, lead to transforming the healthcare delivery to improve quality, incorporate social determinants of health, um, and invest in care coordination. And in theory, this should um, improve access to primary care, result in fewer deaths due to suicide, drug overdose, and reduce prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. So we wanted to show kind of, you know, simply how these relationships just, you know, under the all care model work. So CMS um, contracts with the state, um, there are a number of signatories. Um, the uh, authority kind of flows through the Green Mountain Care Board to oversee the ACO, who then contracts with the payers and the providers in the broader Vermont healthcare delivery system. Um, this is for your reference, a little bit more information on the roles and responsibilities of these different signatories and kind of what they bring to the table in the healthcare. So again, what we're, you know, this model, what it aims to do is to limit cost growth. This is, you know, referencing the benchmark that Sarah Lindbergh just went through and this 3.5% tied to economic growth. Um, we met, there's a Medicare target within that all-payer model target. Um, and we also want to ensure alignment across payers to support participation among providers um, as we think about increasing scale. Um, so the all-payer target for year um, out year five, the five year agreement is 70% of all Vermonters, while the Medicare scale target is 90%. We'll bring those up in more detail year over year later on. Um, population health and quality measures, there are 20 quality performance measures and three key population health goals. Um, improve access to primary care, reduce deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and reduce prevalence and morbid morbidity of chronic disease. I'd like to remind you again that there are a number of levers um, within your control to affect um, how the ACO does its work. Um, one is the ACO budget review process, the ACO certification process, um, and the Medicare ACO program design and rate setting. Uh, there, so these two key processes, certification and budget. Certification occurs one time, so that happened the first year the ACO um, was in this model. Um, and then thereon, we certify their continued eligibility um, annually, but continue to receive documentation um, throughout the year, any changes in policies and procedures that might alter their, their standing. So we, we keep track of this as, as time goes on. Um, the budget review occurs once annually and results in, in the budget order, which um, is kind of the, the deliverable after, after the recommendations are solidified and voted on. 
Uh, we wanted to just quantify the work that we've done to date. This is a very crude estimate of what the team has gone through and, and does not include everything and all the additional analyses um, that have come forth with it. But we've reviewed 714 pages during the budget process, 46 pages during certification. This does not include a re review of all the policies and procedures held by One Care, which is hundreds of pages. Um, and then public comment, we have 26 pages. That was as of the third. Um, I know there have been a couple more that have trickled in, but we've read those in great detail and considered all the public comment as, as we've con conducted our analysis. Um, in addition, together with the HCA, um, we've asked One Care 88 questions this year, and that does not include kind of sub questions, more granular questions. And um, some of those questions were actually pleased to submit, and then um, some data tables along with that. So as we think about the all-parent model and through this ACO oversight process, we want to kind of bring these things together. You know, how do we think about limiting cost growth? So how are the ACO's investments and programs limiting healthcare costs and growth in the near and long term? Um, as we think about achieving scale under the model, how do the ACO's payer programs and provider network impact scale? As we think about improving quality, how are the ACO's investments and programs expected to improve quality and what evidence do, will we have for that in the future? And then improving population health. How do these population health investments tie specifically to these outcomes that we've agreed to in the all pair model? Uh, this is a reminder where we are in this year's process. Um, so we're going to review budget recommendations and um, there will be a potential vote next week. Um, in January is when we expect to issue a budget order. And then in March, we will come back for a review of final attribution and a, perhaps a revised budget. Um, as well as the payer contracts, um, and we receive those from you. Um, so here's the summary of the public comment. Um, we received 16 public comments between October 1st and December 11th from a number um, of providers and um, public individuals. Uh, so some of these, so those are all listed at the top. The major things included primary care and social service providers saw a number of benefits of care coordination as well as population health investments and cited some of those specific benefits um, in their, in their uh, letters. Um, the, you know, some opportunities for um, improvement from FQHC and private citizens noted, you know, around scale, how can we really make sure that we're expanding opportunities for scale outside of just our hospitals, which has been kind of the primary focus in, in primary care. Um, and then there's been this consensus among commentators that um, we should review one care's budget critically and closely, which we feel that we have and, and continue to do as we, as we receive more information. Um, you know, while this is an oh, annual process, we continue to monitor one care throughout the year through quarterly um, submissions, and we expect to continue doing that. So you know, we don't want you to think this is just all we have. This is an ongoing conversation and a process. Um, and then, uh, you know, a number of private citizens commented on Green Mount Care Board's um, some of the deficiencies, which, you know, some of it we address through the budget. And as more information becomes available, like I said, we will continue to evaluate any information that may be relevant. Okay, so now we'll turn it over to Marissa for certification. Good morning. My name is Marissa Melman. I'm going to go through a deeper look at our certification review with you. The Green Mountain Care Board certified one care in March of 2018 after a review and public presentation by the ACO oversight staff. This also included provisional certification in January 2018. Uh, a reminder that an ACO remains certified unless and until its certification is limited, suspended, or revoked by the board. But the ACO must annually submit to the board an eligibility verification form, which includes um, what you see on the slide. Uh, that it verifies the ACO continues to meet the requirements of 18 BSA uh, 9382 and this rule, and that it describes in detail any material changes to the ACO's policies, procedures, programs, organizational structures, provider network, health information infrastructure, or other matters addressed in sections 5.201 through 5.210 of the rule, 
and that the that the ACO has not already reported to the board. So we already include our ongoing reporting and our budget submission as part of the certification review. The timeline um, for our 2019 review for, for FY20, um, we had the form posted uh, by July 1. We received one fair submission September 3rd. Um, there were responses to follow-up questions received October 16th, November 22nd, and December 2nd, and we're here today to um, pre present to you our monitoring reporting conclusions. <coughs> uh, and then also, uh, we mentioned this already, that in 2019, we first, uh, we did our first eligibility verification. Um, so due to considerable overlap in criteria, between the annual budget review and the certification, we've worked to align the two processes in terms of timeline and um, process review. So you'll see that here. Um, this year for fiscal year 20, we're presenting our certification review at the same time as our budget presentation to help align the monitoring and reporting requirements for the year. So you'll see that in the of recommendation. So a reminder, there are 17 statutory criteria in section 9382 for certification. It translates to these 10 sections of rule five. And I'm gonna give you an overview of each section of our review for FY20. So sections 5.201 to 5.203 are concerning um, the legal entity governing body leadership and management. Um, the way we've set up the review to make this clear um, in the public presentation is that you know, the first column is the sections of the rule um, or the statute where that's applicable. Uh, the key criteria in the second column is a summary of what's in the rule criteria. Um, and the third column are ongoing monitoring reporting. So these are policies, procedures, plans, et cetera, that we have identified through our process since 2018 that are applicable to the sections of the rule. Um, and we collect these and review them as they are updated. We've been working with one here to figure out the appropriate frequency um, of collecting these. But our form always asks for the relevant policies <coughs> and um, a summary of what has changed. The fourth column is our uh, conclusions for our FY20 review. Um, and any recommendations for additional monitoring. So we are going to continue to collect and review things in the third column. Um, things in the fourth column are new or changes that we've identified. So for the first several sections, there are several policies that are up for review in quarter four, so they could be reported to us in January. Um, we will collect those. Um, this year, we asked for resumes for the executive team. We've collected um, most of them, but I think we're missing a few. Under the solvency and financial risk section, we currently um, review quarterly financial statements, um, the responsibilities of the finance committee. Um, and this year, through our questions and responses and conversations with One Care, we are asking for more documentation of risk analysis and assessments submitted um, to be submitted to us under this section of the rule, so we will work with one care to figure out what that is going to look like. That's a new recommendation. The next section, uh, Provider Network 5.205. Again, in third column, you'll see the current documentation that we collect and review. Um, this year, we have a recommendation for the <coughs> network development strategy. Um, we've collected this in the past through certification. We've identified some new uh, or some specific elements that we want that to include that we've collected through questions and answers and we want to fit to all be in one report. You're going to see that in the budget recommendations <coughs> when I go over the provider network section with you because um, we felt that fit well in the budget that's noted here. Same thing for the population health management care coordination section. We currently collect several policies and procedures. Um, they are up for review. We will co collect and review them. Um, and this year, we are asking for um, a more robust monitoring and evaluation plan for community-specific population health investments, such as the Innovation Fund and the Specialty Pilots. And again, we decided that fit um, more clearly in the, or we wanted to include it in the budget recommendation. So an advantage of aligning these is that we could see where the overlap was. Um, and this was one area, so you'll see that when Melissa talks about that section. 
2.07, performance evaluation and improvements. Uh, again, continuing to collect their policies and procedures. We've noticed that they have um, things that are up for review in Q4 and then again in Q1. In the patient protections and support section, we have been doing uh, twice yearly complaint and grievance policy reporting, which has been reported to the board publicly as well in our presentations. We will continue that. Um, we collect the beneficiary notification letters. Um, and in the fourth column, we have policies that are up for review. We'll continue to do the complaint and grievance process as outlined, as well as um, review public comment, as we always do, they submit it to the board and collect feedback, you know, ACO specific feedback through the Renown Care Board's advisory committees. Section 209 is provider payment. There are uh, a, more than a handful of policies and new ones have been developed that you'll see here outlining the ACO's provider payment policies. Um, and again, we will continue to collect and review those um, as they are up for review. Under Health Information Technology, Section 5210, same thing, there are policies uh, that outline how they meet the criteria and how they carry out their um, health information technology and data analytics processes, and we collect and review those. Finally, if you'll recall, last year there were several new statutory criteria that uh, I've noted the statute section, they don't appear in the rule because uh, it was after the rule was adopted. But last year, you will remember, we reviewed criteria for reviewing these uh, new elements and the board voted on them. Um, we identified uh, reporting that we wanted the ACO to do, which they completed for the first year in the third column, and we we're going to update those reports um, going forward for each of those sections and continue to request those. So this table provides a summary of our ongoing monitoring and reporting plan. Um, the first is Kind of a large bucket, uh, one care will submit updated and relevant, and relevant plans, policies, procedures, agreements, contracts, subcommittee charters, and governing documents. These are all things we've identified through the review. That happens quarterly, twice annually, or annually, and we have to work that out between the board's needs and the way those plans operationally go through one care. So we will develop a more detailed monitoring plan for collecting those. Financial statements are collected quarterly. Executive team resumes would be upon hire. The new um, requirement for financial uh, and legal vulnerability assessment would be annually, and again, that's going to require a little more discussion um, to figure out exactly what that would look like. Network development strategy is reported annually. It has been reported with quarter one materials in the past. Um, same thing with population health care coordination evaluation plan, complaint and grievance information is semi-annually, and the um, new criteria are reported um, annually as well. So this concludes the certification section of today's presentation. For next steps, we'll review any additional feedback from the board and the public. We'll memorialize our review and the memorandum to the board, and then work to develop the monitoring and reporting plan. For 2020 in conjunction with budget conditions monitoring report. Now we're going to start diving into the budget. So this is just a reminder of the statutory and the rule criteria uh, for the budget review process. Uh, through this review, uh, we'll look at historic and future expenditures, um, the effects of the community <coughs> utilization of innovation services, uh, innovative services, excuse me, um, ACO's efforts to strengthen primary care and social, ser uh, social services, um, social determinants of health, uh, childhood trauma, and then we need to think about reducing duplication of services, um, improved care coordination. Um, we will also think about transparency of costs, uh, the effects of Medicaid reimbursement on other payers. This will happen at a later date, as we will discuss. Um, solvency and ability to assume financial risk, administrative costs, um, and then character-based 
competence to carry out their duties. So some of this, again, overlaps with the certification process, which is why we're presenting both of these pieces today. Um, so there are three main components of OneCare's budget. Um, the first component is the provider reimbursement. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. The second is OneCare's administrative expense, um, which includes some kind of overlap with their population health, but um, and then their population health investments, um, which is $43 million. So as you'll see, the bulk of this $1.4 billion budget is really just provider reimbursements or funds that are kind of already flowing through the system in the, in the form of claims um, are now within flowing through one care and can either be um, rolled back out in fee for service or in a fixed perspective payment, which we'll get to next slide. Um, so again, so this $1,362 million or $1.4 billion budget um, is all a value-based budget. This means that one care is accountable for all of these lives regardless of whether or not they're paid for on fee-for-service or on a fixed perspective payment. 35% um, of uh, reimbursements are fixed perspective payment or estimated to be, and 65% um, are estimated to continue on a fee-for-service basis. And, oh, so as Sarah was talking about earlier, you can see that Medicare is you know, roughly 40% of the budget. Uh, Medicaid is almost 21%. Commercial QHP is 12.3. And the commercial self-funded for 2020 um, is going to be around 27.4, given um, current estimates. Um, so here we have a hospital um, breakout um, of fixed perspective payments. Um, so you can see that it's growing over time and has almost doubled since 2018. Um, we think this is a, a great metric to keep monitoring and have actually uh, one of our first recommendations, if we go to the next slide, um, will be to expand this kind of reporting to other healthcare providers to understand where there may be opportunities for scale, um, not scale, but to increase um, our fixed perspective payment. Um, so looking at FQHCs, independent practice, specialist, primary care, um, independent primary care and hospital primary care to understand uh, where those uh, where those opportunities might lie. Uh, we'd also love to see this information by payer. So it's important to remember that provider reimbursements in this budget are only as good as the estimates and attributions. So as Ms. Sarah alluded to this morning, and we'll continue to talk about how these are just based on one care's estimates and that they won't be final until the new year. However, we can still make a lot of, um, lay a lot of groundwork to understand how the budget might change um, as attribution might change. So we can say something um, about what we expect to happen and kind of parameters around what we want their budget to look like, but we just want to keep in mind that this is in flux. Um, how attribution is determined is based on um, whether or not an individual has um, insurance through a provider that is participating in the ACO program as well as whether or not the individual attends uh, or seeks care from a provider who, had, who was participating in the network. So there might be instances where you have insurance, but your insurance provider may not be participating, so you would not be attributed. Or you might have you know, Medicare and it might be, it might be attributed, but um, the provider that you are seeking care from is not participating in the network. Uh, so these are examples of how you might fall into these different categories. Um, and the reimbursement or the, the revenue that's going through one care is determined not only by um, the number of lives but also those lives historical expenditures. So that's how we abide that some of these estimates. So we'll go through payer programs and the provider network um, uh, separately in more detail. Uh, we want to just first let you know the board know that these analyses are based solely on one care's budget submission. Uh, we have not had the opportunity to analyze any actual or pending contracts. Um, as these contracts are still under negotiation, this is uh, the same kind of situation that we've been in year over year. Um, and you know, through this process, again, we kind of talk about these contingencies with this understanding um, that we will have final attribution numbers and contracts at a later date. Um, and then we expect that one care and, and the staff will come before the board again to discuss where that revised budget um, will fall. So to kind of give you a sense of the kind of programs that are um, expected for 2020, um, Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross um, Blue Shield QHP program are expected to continue um, with the addition of two new potential peer programs one being Blue Cross Blue Shield Administrative Services Only, or large group program, 
um, the second being MVP's QHB program. Um, as a reminder, um, you know, historically we have uh, advocated that that these programs should um, align um, a scale target or qualify scale target initiatives. These are the four criteria that would render a program um, a scale target initiative. So having the possibility of shared savings for achieving goals related to quality and, and care utilization. Um, the ACO shared savings as a percentage of its expenditures, less than the benchmark is at a minimum 30%. And if the ACO is at risk for shared losses, it's shared losses as a percent of its expenditures in excess of the benchmark is at a minimum of 30%. Uh, services comparable to, but not limited to, the all pair financial target services and their associated expenditures are included for the determination of these shared savings and losses. Um, and the ACO's benchmark shared savings and shared losses or a combination is tied to the quality of care that the ACO delivers and the health of its aligned beneficiaries or both. So this is really just saying, you know, all these things have to work together. They can't just have shared savings and losses, they can't just have quality outcomes, these things have to be integrated for the system to work. So that's why it's important for these pair programs um, to meet these criteria. Um, of the existing and new programs, we expect at this time that all um, shall continue to be qualified. Um, as scale target initiatives, we will reevaluate certainly once the final contracts come in and ensure that that is the case. Um, in, a, in addition, uh, there's also a requirement all pair model for alignment across payer programs, um, and alignment specifically to the Medicare um, program. So that would be on um, attribution methodology, quality measures, payment mechanisms, and services including um, included in the determination of shared savings and losses. So this table outlines what we know to be or what we estimate or one year has estimated to date um, where they will land um, in these in these negotiations. This was based on their October 1st submission, so you know these are still in flux. Uh, we don't have any information at this time on the new contracts, but across the existing contracts there seems to be greater alignment. Um, the only notable differences, which are actually exciting opportunities, are in the Medicaid um, payer program, uh, there's a conversation around geographic attribution, which is um, interesting because it might be able to bring in um, greater scale and specifically those who don't currently or may not currently be um, engaging with their primary care provider. So it, it, it's a great thing if, if, it, if it works and we hope to hear more about it as, as it rolls out. Um, in addition, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, there's no longer the Pharma, uh, pharmacy services included in the financial target, so now these are all in alignment. This describes the trend rate, so I'm just gonna kind of breeze through these, because this is where Sarah spent most of the morning discussing, and I think we'll have you know more um, to discuss um, at a later date, but you know, the one year budget 3.9% for their trend rate for um, Medicare, 0.5% for Medicaid, 6% uh, for the commercial QHP, 4.05% for their self-funded um, for a total of 3.5% overall. Um, there, you know, there might be differences in how um, we determine base experience um, versus how one care is done. We use you know, CMS data in order to do that for, for Medicare and a number of other inputs for Medicaid, commercial QHP, et cetera. Um, so, but in all, I think what's important to know here is that the budgeted PMPMs are roughly equivalent between where you know what we've been estimating um, and what one care has been estimating. So the effect on the budget should be um, you know only small dollars. Um, so as I said this this morning, you know we're at 23.5 percent growth. Um, Medicaid um, is currently you know estimated at 0.5, but um, this is subject to the Medicaid advisory rate case. Um, I want to note here that you know, this doesn't take into account repricing the 0.5% proposed by one care, um, which is held harmless under the all-payer model. We just don't have that information um, to be able to make that determination. Um, in the commercial QHP rates, one care has said that this was derived from the Green Mountain Care Board's approved rates in the insurance rate review process, um, and we don't have any information on self-funded rates for this time. So our recommendations around payer programs um, are as follows. Uh, so first one, or, or recommendation number two, 
um, but the final payer contract must qualify scale target initiatives and they should align with Medicare on attribution methodology, quality metrics, payment risk terms, services included in the financial target. So this is in line with 2019 budget recommendations. Um, so we would like one here to come before the board on a date agreed upon by both parties, but no later than April 1st in the new year to present our final attribution, their revised 2020 budget based on that attribution and their final payer contracts. Um, we'd also like to see one care create a one pager on the benefits to self-funded programs of contracting with one care. Um, and then if the geographic attribution methodology is implemented, uh, we'd like to see the implementation manual associated with that so we can learn a bit more about how it's expected to work and how they're going to roll it out. For the trend rates, um, you know, we're just echoing what Sarah discussed this morning, 3.5% Medicare rate uh, with the vote next week. Um, Medicaid, what we do at this time, because we don't typically have the advisory rate case, um, is that we're going to recommend to adopt a percentage within that range, but is subject to the Medicaid advisory rate case. Um, and then the commercial QHP and self-funded language, we're just rolling this forward from last year, given um, that contracts are still under negotiation. We would like to receive actuari actuarial certifications for each of the commercial plans, including self-funded benchmarks, stating that the benchmark is adequate but not excessive. Um, and an explanation of how its overall rate of growth across payers fits within the overall all-payer target rate of growth and its overall rate of growth exceeds the target, um, how it plans to achieve the cumulative target uh, under the all-payer model agreement over the term of the agreement. So if Jess has a question. Just before you skip to the next slide, can you just give us an update on the timing of the Medicaid rate case and the weekly estimates? Yeah, so I, I, they're currently working um, on it right now. I think by the end of the year is when we hope to have um, the Medicaid rate case by. Thank you. So as a reminder, I'm, well, I'm going to go through the provider network uh, section now of the, of the budget. As a reminder, the One Care ACO Provider Network is built on the foundation of participation by the home hospital. So this graphic visualizes 15 hospital service areas in Vermont, which include 14 Vermont hospitals and Dartmouth Hitchcock in New Hampshire, and it shows increased participation in payer programs by these HSAs from 2017 to 2020. Just a quick plug, this visualization is available on our Tableau Public website if people haven't had a chance to check that out. There's also several other um, visualizations out there that the board, the data team has been working on to make uh, information collected by the board more accessible and available to the public. So this is a summary of the provider network changes from 2019 to 2020 as described in the One Care Budget Narrative or uh, as analyzed from the provider network table 2.1 that they submitted to us. Um, this is the same information um, that One Care presented during their budget hearing. Um, I'm reviewing it here because we have um, received questions from board members essentially that asking um, what does the ACO network look like compared to the full provider landscape of Vermont. So we want to be responsive um, to that um, with this review. So the question is in relation to both understanding how One Care is building their network and in relation to some of the board's other work of mapping and understanding healthcare resources in the state, including providers and workforce. Um, so this year, the network has expanded by the, the Morrisville HSA to include Coffee Hospital for the Medicaid program. Uh, the Newport HSA has some um, has expanded into the Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP program, and Community Health Centers of Burlington um, has also added that program. So we've gained an, an HSA this year, uh, three FQHCs, uh, three independent primary care practices, naturopathic practice, uh, three additional independent specialists, four independent physical therapy practices one designated mental health agency, three new skilled nursing facilities, and an agreement with the Ambulatory Surgical Center. Um, we also looked at a reduction in the network. Uh, so Springfield is no longer participating in the Medicare program. They were in all programs in FY19. Um, we did an analysis of the provider network table 2.1, and I want to say this is a 
board analysis, we did not get this directly from one care, so I wouldn't need to validate it, but um, it appears that they had dropped five specialist practices um, and one primary care practice. Challenges that were noted in the one care budget, um, specifically you'll see this for the, the specialist practices that expansion to the Medicare program due to the magnitude of downside risk and operational concerns is a challenge they identified. Um, and recruitment of independent specialists due to lack of eligibility for incentives in the Medicare merit-based incentive payment system. This is another look um, and, a, and a sort of an attempt for us to look at this question of what does the one care network look like in relation to the total landscape. I want to stress that this is these are rough estimate numbers. Some of them just came in yesterday, um, but we present it because uh, we want to show responsiveness to this question and uh, our evolving understanding of the full landscape of providers that we want to incorporate into this analysis. Um, so we divide it up by hospital, uh, sorry, by provider types. So hospitals, again, we've seen um, increase from 12 hospitals last year to uh, 13 of Vermont's 14 hospitals. This year, federally qualified health centers, um, nine of 12, uh, FQHC entities are participating, it's up from six last year. Um, primary care practices is the one that has, um, is the most estimated. So you might be tempted to do a proportion participating, but I would hesitate to do that at this time. But uh, we want you to see that this is something that we are working on. Data that I received from BDH yesterday is that there are about 267 total primary care practices uh, in Vermont. So we have 76 uh, is our estimate of included primary care practices that are hospital-based, and we got this from hospital provider directories online. Uh, One Care reports 29 independent primary care providers participating, um, and that's up five from the previous year. And then FQHCs, um, Again, this is data that I got from VH. It might not be totally accurate, but um, that there are 54 sites total in our estimate um, by the number of entities is that it's approximately 49 of those are participating. Um, if any uh, stakeholders want to help us validate this data, we welcome that. Um, independent specialists, <coughs> as I mentioned before, One Care reports that 25 are participating. Um, this is an area where, from what we could tell from the provider table too, they've lost five and gained three, and so this is a, a, a challenge area, as, as is mentioned in the budget submission, and we don't have a good estimate of the total uh, landscape of independent specialists. Um, home health and hospice, we have um, nine of nine participating. Skilled nursing facilities is up several um, to 27 of 38 designated agencies. There are 10 um, of 16, and in the other category, which so far includes physical therapy in the Inventory Surgical Center, um, we had one from this area participating last year and six participating this year. And a, per, in terms of participation, um, that table also includes whether they're include, participating in the full capitated payment or fee for service. This includes providers that are participating um, with long care, either through fee-for-service with accountability for total cost of care, which could be an on-ramp to take down capitated payments or for full AI PVP. Uh, on the next slide, um, again, this is just showing which hospital service areas don't have representation in these groups. So, uh, great colleagues are only hospital, but it's very small, and most of those patients are actually represented in other hospitals, so there's essentially full hospital coverage. Um, federally qualified health centers, we've picked up several, um, however, they're still unrepresented. Uh, HSAs, though Brattleboro, for example, does not have an FQHC. Primary care practices, um, again, we have good hospital coverage there for independents. There's room for expansion, same with independent specialists. For home health and hospice, all communities are uh, in the network. Uh, for skilled nursing facilities, there's, we're seeing several uh, DAs, all communities are represented, and in the other category, there's room for expansion. So the data I've shown here before, I want to stress is preliminary and it's ongoing work being done by the board. 
Um, the GMCB is working in collaboration with the Vermont Department of Health to quantify and map the provider landscape as part of the Health Resource Allocation Plan project. I also should have mentioned the Rural Health Services Task Force, which is working on this um, as well. And they kindly um, let me put this graphic up here, which is yeah, just to show what we're working toward. This graphic maps all primary care practices in Vermont. Um, by type overlaid um, with FTEs per 1,000. And in terms of ACO review, we could um, also put an ACO layer on there and, and address that question of, of how well um, their network coverage is. So this leads me to our recommendation. Um, from our analysis of provider network information that we gleaned from the ACO budget and the certification materials, we developed the following recommendation, uh, which I mentioned earlier with certification, that we would like one care to submit their 2021 network development strategy to include the following elements. So they've submitted this before. This year we're asking for more specific uh, things to be included. So the first one is new and is maybe going to take a little bit of um, working out, but it's to include a definition for ACO network composition unnecessary to maximize value-based incentives. And this comes from conversation that's been had about what does network adequacy mean for an ACO. The term network adequacy is a term of art that applies to insurance companies. Um, so we, but we wanted to still think about um, what that might mean for an ACO. Um, so we'd like to have that conversation um, and have it included in the plan. Provider outreach strategy, recruitment acceptance criteria, their network development timeline, um, have all been included in the past. We just want to be specific about it. We'd also like one care to, to quantify providers dropping out of the network um, and reasons why so that we can better understand the challenges to network development. Before you go to scale, Marissa, I just want to point out that last night I had a conversation with a board member from the FQHC in Rutland and um, they, they find it offensive that we always refer to them as chitcher, and um, they would prefer, they would prefer to be referred to as community health. So, thank you. So now we're bringing it back together, to back to scale. So provider network and um, and the payer program. Uh, so, what is scale? So, it's a percentage of Vermonters attributed to the scale target ACO initiative. Um, and this is designed to ensure that a critical mass of Vermonters' population is engaged in the all payer model, and hence that providers have a real opportunity to change their care delivery and business models to support value, not volume, and a migration from treating episodic illness to prevention. Um, so, that being said, this is largely tied to administrative burden as well. So, the more, the longer that providers continue to operate in two systems, they have to kind of think about how that you know, might affect their business model. Um, so, as you can see, there's different targets for the all payer model and the Medicare scale target um, over time. And um, by year five, we are expected um, by our federal partners to reach 70% scale for the all payer model and 90% for the Medicare uh, scale target. Um, this is just some background. Uh, you've probably seen this slide before that talks about the different populations um, relevant to the all-payer model. So you have the Vermont population, <coughs> uh, the population uh, used to, to, uh, to determine all-payer model scale. Um, so it's like the total possible um, scale denominator, um, as well as the total cost of care denominator. The GoBay decision is about um, data reporting um, by self-insured populations. So that's why that came down. Um, and then there's this notion of ACO attributed versus not attributed, and then the ACO Medicare Live. So these are all kind of nested populations, um, and we just wanted to kind of call out that it's important to understand which population you're talking about when understanding uh, different pieces of the model. Uh, so given one care's budget, we wanted to provide some estimates of where we expect scale to land as compared to prior year. Um, so they have indicated that they expect approximately 53,000 attributed lives in Medicare. Um, this would be a, a slight drop from last year in Medicare population. Um, Medicaid, they've um, used 94,000 lives as their estimate for their budget. For commercial self-funded, 66. Um, 
fully uh, commercial fully insured, thirty five, almost thirty six thousand lives. So this is for a total of two hundred and fifty thousand, almost two hundred fifty thousand attributed lives, um, which is an increase from prior year. So maybe not from Medicare, but from some of their other payer programs. Uh, in response to not meeting scale targets, um, the board conducted a survey um, over the summer, um, mainly with hospitals and FDHC partners to identify barriers to scale and potential strategies that the state, um, the federal, our federal partners and the ACO, as well as local partners, um, could pursue to improve um, scale and, and experience with the model in general. Um, strategies that were identified through this survey fell into two broad categories. The first being around unit structure um, and that it should be more transparent, predictable, and sustainable. Um, the second, um, that payments from the ACO and participating payers must offset any additional administrative and reporting requirements. So this is the administrative burden component that um, I mentioned earlier. Um, and incentivize delivery reform with a greater emphasis on prevention and health improvement. So we want to work towards population health. So a lot of what we heard is in line with um, expectations of excuse me, the all parent model agreement. Um, I think they just advocated for some um, more nuanced ways of how we might get there. Um, so this brings us to, well, this will go through some examples um, of what uh, these partners identified as uh, next steps for one care. <coughs> So some examples include designing an option for primary care to join the model without the hospital partner, um, offering multiple risk models based on hospital size and readiness, improve clarity of contracts with FQHCs, um, expectations for global goals execution methodology, offer or facilitate network-based telehealth opportunities to smaller providers, um, continue to improve care navigator to allow use for all patients, not just ACO-attributed lives, and reduce burden of duplicate record keeping by line uploads for existing EMR systems. So the administrative burden, well, you know, they've made significant progress on some fronts. There's you know, there's always the opportunity to pursue that further. Um, we posted the scale target memo, I think when it initially happened on our website, we've included it here for reference if you'd like to look into more detail. Um, and so part of our recommendation, we'd like one care to report formally on the status of their scale target memo follow-up items. Um, during their presentation on final attribution and revised budget, so that honor before or before April first deadline that we alluded to earlier. Can I just make a very quick comment sure. on scale, and particularly in relationship to Medicare, because we had also had an analysis presented to us from Sarah Lindbergh a while ago. Now I don't remember when exactly, um, which when she looked at the Medicare attribution methodology, and this actually might be in the scale memo, um, what we have learned since the negotiation of the agreement is that it's not, it's not, literally not possible to reach the 90% Medicare target because of the way that Medicare does attribution, which is not something that is state specific to our model. So I think it's just important to remember that, that um, the scale targets that were negotiated didn't have the benefit of that uh, detailed uh, attribution analysis, but it's important to remember that we already know we're not going to get to 90% the way that Medicare does attribution, and it would be require a change on Medicare's part in order for us to get there. That's absolutely accurate. Thank you, Robin, for reminding us. Um, and this was also evident in the June scale target report. Um, thank you. Now we're going to talk about the Commander's model of care and their population health investments. So this table is actually taken from the 2017 population health plan that was produced at the end of the SIN project. Um, we were writing a report for the legislature recently on the integration of social services within the ACO and the progress that's been made thus far. Um, and you know, it provides a roadmap for where Vermont and the stakeholders wanted to go. Uh, in the first column, we have what's called episodic or non-integrated care, where we would have a lack of coordinated networks, lack of quality and cost performance transparency, and poorly coordinated and chronic care management. So 
in our conversations and analysis, we you know, are falling squarely into delivering outcome-based accountable care. Um, it's person-centered with a focus on care management. Um, one thing that we noticed during the process of this review is that the state agencies are working with the ACO to implement po population-based strategies, and those are that's how we're going to get into the 3.0 category. I know it's a little hard to read, but some of the things in that category include healthy population-centered care, not just person-centered care, um, population health-focused strategies, which OneCare and the networks are working to coordinate, um, population-based reimbursement. So right now we're doing value-based reimbursement. Uh, a next step would be uh, population-based reimbursement. And then learning organizations, which OneCare has been working toward um, at the local level that are able to deploy best practices that they're learning from their data. So it was um, a fun trip down memory lane. <laughs> <coughs> this table is actually also from the SIM Population Health Plan. Um, in our slides, the way right up at the top, that's where the accountable care organization lives. Um, then going over, we have the Agency of Human Services and the Director of Healthcare Reform. We have the Blueprint for Health, the Green Mountain Care Board, and, and you know additional stakeholders that are then working with the community collaboratives, which are all out in the 14 communities and were developed by the Blueprint. The green circles going around are all the providers that OneCare is working with and that are working together to improve population health and value-based care. And some of those include the home health agencies and the hospitals, um, the housing providers, and SASH. So it's it's important to remember that there are a lot of stakeholders out there working on this reform, um, especially as we're doing our own review. Um, they then work on community priorities, which they've identified themselves based on their own data and community needs um, and what they would like to respond to in that community. Okay, so. Threading that needle forward, OneCare's role is working with this statewide network of providers to increase access and quality of care while reducing unnecessary costs. And you know, in our review, we found that they were doing this through two major ways. Um, they're supporting that statewide care transformation and payment reform network and activities that are happening at the local levels. And some of them, of the examples, and not inclusive, but of the work that they're doing is they're coordinating with the Blueprints Community Health um, Community Collaboratives to identify gaps in care and use data to perform quality improvement activities. They're providing <coughs> compilation of claims data for these collaboratives and providers to work on utilization, cost, and quality. They've built up the Care Navigator tool that Elena just referenced, which is an electronic <coughs> online platform for all providers or for care managers to use in order to communicate with each other around complex patients. Um, they're also working with negotiating care contracts that are value-based, and then also um, developing and managing a fixed payment methodology. So the second piece, which I'm going to dive into a bit more next, are the payments and community-based new initiatives for population health. Um, so some of these payments support daily efforts in primary care, and then others are to fund new innovations with outcomes for potential replicability. Um, this shows where population health investments of OneCare fall into. Um, so we found in our analysis that 70% of their payments are actually tied into their payer contracts, which means that um, there are deliverables in those contracts that OneCare is accountable for. Um, some of those projects are listed there, and they're also listed on the next page, but they include Dulce, which is a childhood resilience program, Rise Vermont, which is a prevention program, they have Remember Per Month payments and a comprehensive payment reform program, and like I said, I'll go into them a little bit more on the next slide. The next section is the Medicare funding for the Blueprint for Health programs that was talked about earlier this morning. Um, which has grown from 7.7 .7 in 2017 to 8.2 million <coughs> due to our regulatory responsibility and uh, work with CMMI. And that supports, that goes directly out to support the SASH program, the community health teams, and the blueprints, the Medicare portion of the patient centered medical home payments. And then finally, um, we found that about 10% fall into uh, the community specific projects, which OneCare is funding. Um, some of them are 
in an innovation fund, and then some of them go toward pilots uh, with working with specialty providers to bring them more into the continuum of care. Uh, this is all of those projects from the last page by the same colors um, and the categories of investments that we found. So uh, a large portion of them fall into primary care investments. Uh, then they're also investing in quality, care coordination, prevention, and then as we mentioned, the blueprint, which are, are all of those things, primary care quality and um, care coordination, and then finally, um, some, some of the innovation funding at the bottom. So what we found for 2020, um, the main changes that we found in the population health programs fell into three categories. Uh, one is that there'll be uh, putting money towards additional innovation projects, um, which is determined through a grant process and through their population health strategy committee. Then they've also determined that they're interested in embedding clinical pharmacists in primary care, and the evidence shows around that that pharmacists in primary care can help to lower healthcare costs, improve quality of care, and increase patient satisfaction, since pharmacists are often not in the medical setting, but it play an integral role in providing that integrated care. And then finally, the bottom one is um, they've, they're making some changes to their complex care coordination program, um, where they're gonna be increasing the payments to providers. So that I go into <coughs> the next slide. Um, so what the complex care coordination program is, it are payments for providers. Uh, the providers that qualify are primary care, home health, and the designated agencies who are providing care for high risk and very high risk patients um, as identified through One Care's data. And on the left are, were the care coordination payments that were provided from 17 to 19 for these types of providers. Um, they fell into two major buckets. One was providing care coordination, just based on deliverables that One Care has in their contracts with these providers. And the second bucket is it's called patient activation. So every patient needs to have a, a shared care plan so that everyone knows what that patient needs and they can use it for a communication tool. And it lives in Care Navigator, as we previously described. Um, one here was noticing that they weren't achieving the activation rate that they were looking for from patients. Uh, they were at about 7% in their measurements. And complex care coordination has been shown to reduce costs. You know, you were getting your patient to the right care at the right time. So based on um, town hall meetings and stakeholder feedback, their network decided to try out a new model, which is the one on the right. So they increased that per adult life or per member per month payment to um, make sure that a patient has a shared care plan in Care Navigator and then they're paid monthly on that. Anyone else who's participating in that patient's care team gets $60. Anyone who is designated as the lead care coordinator by the patient is receiving $80. And then secondly, um, they're required to have a care conference which brings all of those providers together. And so it takes a lot of effort to get everyone to the same page and make sure that that patient is getting what they need. So those, those lead care coordinators or that, I would say that agency receives $300 once a year. And then anyone else participating in that care team receives $150. Um, these numbers per our conversation with One Care were derived by the network to allow for care coordination or care coordinators to actually hire <coughs> the prior PMPMs weren't quite high enough and so it wasn't allowing the infrastructure necessary at the local level. Can I ask a clarifying question? Certainly. Yeah. Um, uh, my recollection is that the lead care coordinator is chosen <coughs> by the patient. Yes, that is true. Okay. And uh, my other clarifying question is um, Actually, that was it. Thank yeah, you. and so to bring that to a local level, I might be working, if I'm a patient and I have a primary care doctor, and I'm also working with a designated agency, and I might even be enrolled in home health, I would get to choose where I want <coughs> my lead care coordinator to be. And based on the data that was 
provided to us. A, prim a majority of them are still in primary care, but some patients may feel more comfortable being coordinated by someone with their designated agency or home health. Um, so we have several recommendations that we will go into in a little bit, but we wanted to unpack a ratio that we've been using to measure the investments in population health over the past several years with one care. Um, we applied this in 2018 when we first reviewed their budget. So what, it, what this ratio is, is basically the population health investments, we can take the final column, which are budgeted at 43 million, and put that over the $1.4 um, billion. That brings us to a ratio of 3%. Um, last year, that ratio was 4%. It's directly <coughs> driven by the amount of dollars that are going to providers. And um, because we don't know what that attribution is yet, or the final contracts, um, we would like to, you know, last year we had, so last year, this was our requirement in our 2019 budget order um, that they must fund the PHM, what? <laughs> so it's currently, it's still this year, um, that they must fund their population health investments at no less than 3.6, so we gave them a variance of 0.5 from the 4.1% and that they must fund the SASH and the Blueprint for Health Investments at the um, Medicare level plus the inflationary rate of 3.8%, which we gave them last year for their Medicare benchmark. Um, and then if these percentages were less, one care needed to promptly alert the board to this. So we're en envisioning something like that, but we don't feel like it's time yet to put a final ratio on that. So what we are proposing is that we receive their final care contracts the final attribution numbers, one here providing an analysis uh, for the board on each <coughs> population health line item to determine whether and why um, they're scaled appropriately for attribution or some other factor um, when we receive their revised budget in the first quarter of 2020. And then these are the recommendations for the population health investments, which I can read. Uh, they are a little bit small. Um, the first one is um, exactly as we just said, that if programs are not fully funded as detailed in the 2020 budget, one care will be putting forth a revised proposal for the board. Um, in terms of monitoring, we're looking for the population health investments to be recorded by the health service area quarterly and by program and by different provider types to see what that distribution of dollars are. For number 11, um, we're asking that one care use their community specific population health investments for the innovation fund and specialty pilots to address cost and quality differences across health service areas as identified in their variations in care analyses. And these investments shall be evidence-based, be assessed for return on investment, and be tracked by the ACO. The next one um, Marissa spoke to when we were talking about certification, that we're asking one here to develop a work plan to evaluate the effectiveness of any population health investment. And this includes how they could scale those um, that are successful, how they might sunset those that are not, and then report on opportunities for sustainability of these programs. Um, so this plan could include, but is not limited to, the type of entity, the funding, the evidence for the funding, the distribution plan, so basically just a robust work plan for each line item. And um, we would expect that this be submitted to the board in the first quarter of 2020. And then finally, we would like One Care to provide a mid-year update on the 2020 Complex Care Coordination Program, which would include data on enrollment, um, payments, and any challenges or learnings that they have found from this change um, in their Complex Care Coordination Program. This would, I'm saying mid-year, it does not start until April 2020, so mid-year or the third quarter, um, whatever makes sense in, um, with one here.
Uh, so I'm just going to give a pretty brief overview of uh, the process for measuring and reporting on quality performance. Um, and I'll highlight some aspects of Rule 5, which you heard Marissa talk through, um, and also just a reminder of what we're responsible for through the all player model agreement. I know we're specifically here talking about ACO budgets, but it's um, hard to not, it's hard to disentangle those things in some of these instances. So just a quick walkthrough. Um, and as a reminder, and you heard Elena and I talk about this on the 20th when we um, were part of the panel presenting on One Care's 2018 quality results, um, that you know, there's a, there are separate requirements for reporting for the all pair model agreement and the measures for which the state is held accountable, and then the measures for which the ACO is accountable for through their payer contracts. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, so this here, just a reminder of the requirements through the all pair model agreement. Uh, and again, um, I have a citation from page one of the agreement that I was going to read through, but it's, it's quite long. Uh, so then I'll just talk about what's required through the quality report um, and what we must include. So first, we have to talk about the process on the quality targets. And as a reminder, we've got 20 required measures as, a, as uh, per the agreement. And that one monitoring measure that we are currently working out with our um, DIVA team, our, our friends over at Medicaid, to figure out what um, the best sort of uh, measurement for that is moving forward. And that's the proportion um, of folks receiving care through specialist, and not, it's an access measure, specialty versus primary care. Um, the second, uh, through the, the annual quality report that we have to focus on is how scale target ACO initiatives hold Vermont ACOs accountable for quality of care, the health of their aligned beneficiaries, or both. You heard Elena talk about that. You'll probably hear me repeat it ad nauseum between now and the end of the agreement. Uh, and the third thing that we need to talk about is how the state holds Vermont ACOs accountable to allocate funding for and invest in community health services to achieve those statewide health outcomes and quality of care targets. Um, as a reminder for the corrective action triggers in the agreement, we need to meet four out of six of our population health outcomes targets, four out of seven of the healthcare delivery system quality targets, and five out of seven of our process milestones um, before we would hit a corrective action trigger for any of those specific subcategories. Um, Uh, and then a reminder through Rule 5, um, and again, Marissa talked about these earlier, so I just wanted to give a, a quick highlight. So there's also requirements, obviously, through Rule 5, specific to the ACO, and so here are a couple of expert, um, excerpts that outline some of those requirements. So first is the provider network. ACO's participant selection criteria must relate to the needs of the ACO and enrollee population it serves, including access to and quality of care. I'll note everything that's emphasized on here is, is <coughs> unique. It's not like that in the rule. Uh, the second is um, 5.206, that's the Population Health Management and Care Coordination section. A primary function of the ACO is to improve enrollees' quality of care by enhancing that coordination and management of services the enrollees receive. And this is just a summary of section 5.207. It's the most meaty section of um, quality requirements in the rule and that's the quality evaluation and improvement section. Um, so just um, some highlights, it requires an ACO to have a quality and evaluation improvement program that identifies problems in healthcare delivery and opportunities for improvement, evaluates the care delivered to patients against defined measures and standards, and must utilize evaluations to provide feedback to participants to improve the quality of care. You might have forgotten, Marissa talked about these around slide 20. So. <laughs> uh, a couple of things we just wanted to highlight. So as I already mentioned, um, we had the ACO come and present with the pair of programs, their annual 2018 quality results on November 20th. Uh, that process will continue annually as results become available from the pair programs. Um, and second, the 2018 all care model results will be presented by GMCB's staff <laughs> when they become available. Um, as a reminder from the 1120 presentation, uh, the quality results are annual. So 2018, as you'll recall, is the first year of the agreement. So we won't be offering any trend analyses in those reports. 
um, it will simply be the result of 2018 um, until we get the 2019 data in the books, which will be around this time next <coughs> year. Um, that's when we'll start to produce some more analyses on results over time. Um, also, as a reminder, while some of the all pair model measures are the same as some of the ACO pair contract measures, um, they're not all the same, and so there have been questions about um, where we'll be able to identify the ACO population and where we won't. Um, and so I think uh, that will come into play also. So for example, any of the population health measures um, utilizing survey data, so from the behavioral health risk factor surveillance system, I think I got it right, um, we can't figure out who in that population is, is attributed to the ACO or not. And so that measure will always just be consistent over time, and that trend will not be broken down by ACO and non-ACO participating. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, kind of uh, we will be analyzing quality performance once the ACO results become available. And again, we're not going to be able to look at all of the required measures through the all pair model agreement by ACO and non-ACO participants. Uh, and the second is, per the requirement in the agreement, we'll work to develop a policy for ACO regulation on quality performance um, in alignment with that requirement um, of how the state holds, us, holds the ACO accountable to allocate that funding and invest in community health services um, to achieve those targets that are outlined in the agreement. Can you just remind us when, when you think the timeline of that is, <laughs> roughly? the all pair model final yeah when you think you'll be presenting yeah so um what i am currently working through with our federal partners is a conversation on um producing the data that we do have by the end of this year and then producing a supplement to that report or if it's preferred from the federal government that we wait until we have all of the required data so if the latter um, sometime in january it's likely that i'll be presenting to the board early in the year um, and part of that has to do with any of those claims-based measures that we needed to wait for run out on um, to be able to appropriately calculate. We wanted to make sure that it was done accurately. Um, and so, uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier, we're just now starting to get that final data in. Um, so while hopefully moving forward, it will always be done by the end of December, um, this year is a little bit of an exception. Thank you. Organization 
um, is actually decreasing. That being said, as we mentioned before, you know, there are a lot of um, elements still in flux um, that might affect this ratio. So we, we, want, we kind of um, try to pick apart, you know, what are some realistic scenarios of, um, you know, swings left or right that could occur with attribution and funding that might affect where they, where they would end up. Um, and we, we still feel like the 1.35 is pretty robust to some of these swings. Um, on, on the left, you'll see we call it low growth. We made some assumptions about um, available funding and if they're decreasing um, attribution. And we still calculated, you know, just 1.6% um, administrative expense ratio um, under high growth conditions. If they were awarded the funding and they had this growth in attribution, you know, they might still look at 1.2 per 8% of the budget. Um, so, if we, this is our recommendation number 14, if total revenues are, are projected to increase, the administrative expense ratio shall not exceed 1.35, and if total revenues are projected to decrease, the administrative expense ratio shall not exceed the 1.6%, unless otherwise approved by the board. Um, and then we wanted to, you know, reference this, the board will review this condition upon final attribution, so if there are really dramatic swings beyond kind of what we baked into some of these assumptions that we would revisit <coughs> at that time. If there are no questions on administrative expense, we'll continue to risk concerns. So while there, uh, we wanted to, this is kind of a broader discussion and we've been working with um, some independent contractors to think about risk and reserves at a system level um, and how this, how we might think about this across our regulatory levers. Um, so this is kind of, um, we still have work to do here, but wanted to share some of our thoughts um, that we've been developing. So, to review the different types of risk flowing through the system. So the first is insurance risk. So this is the financial risk that is based on the prevalence, severity, and types of health conditions that occur in a population. Uh, there's also now performance risk. So the financial risk based on what is done to mitigate those health conditions. So this performance risk is really affected both by the ACO and the provider, and also by the population's willingness or ability to access those services. Um, so the key takeaway is there's kind of this, this overlap between um, these types of risk, but that you know both types of risk can be measured and, and are transferred in this model to the providers. Um, and here are our providers. So um, in, in this model, those providers are mainly the hospitals who are bearing the majority of this risk. Um, and that's, there we go. All right, so the percentage of financial risk transferred to one care varies by payer as a percentage of total healthcare spending on uh, payers transfer approximately 3.2% of all payer aggregated financial risk onto one care. Um, the remaining risk resides with each individual payer. So at a system level, it's only 3.2%. So there, I, we just wanted to highlight, um, highlight that for you. And then of the 27.3 million of Medicare, um, so it's 5% of Medicare expenditures, um, that one here projects um, at risk in 2020 um, is being transferred to the hospitals. And then if you take it to consideration, into consideration the risk reinsurance, um, this drops down to $15 million or 2.8% of Medicare spending. And as this flows through, this affects the total bottom line, reducing the overall risk um, by two, to 2.3%. This is just a, a visualization of the relative amounts of risk by payer to the total revenues, so dollars at risk or not at risk. So you can see that Medicare and Medicaid are kind of the leaders in the amount of risk that's um, being proposed, um, but really it's still a, a relatively small portion of the overall dollars. <coughs> This is a, a, a bit another way of looking at it that looks at the third party risk insurance. So it's really 28% of the Medicare risk, uh, or of the overall risk. Um, it's a large chunk of the Medicare risk. Um, and it kind of shows the relative um, magnitude of risk by, by risk. So while the risk bearing entities are individually at risk, for the amounts um, totaling 44 million impacted the Medicare third party reinsurance means that the hospitals um, will have access to this risk reinsurance 
uh, to mitigate their total risk exposure. So um, it, right here it's shown in aggregate, but th these dollars would flow back through um, the provider network, if, depending on the magnitude and, the, and what actually occurs. So at a system level is 32.8. I'm sorry, 31.8. <coughs> Uh, if we look at hospital maximum risk limits, um, you know, we want to point out first that there are three hospitals still in their risk mitigation uh, strategies. Um, so this reduces the total amount of risk down to 40 million from the 44. Um, and then we looked at days cash on hand and MRL is the percentage of days cash on hand. Um, I don't know if you can see, I have a hard time seeing the break of um, But this kind of breaks out the percentage of um, of the system level um, relative to their um, MRI. Before you jump into the risk model, can yeah. I just ask a question? So sure. I think it's helpful to have the risk as a uh, percentage of total healthcare spending, but since the hospitals are taking on the risk for all providers uh, in their community, it would also, I think, be helpful to show it as a percentage of the hospital spending because uh, even though it's a relatively small percentage of the overall spending for the hospital taking on that risk for every other provider, I, I think it would look differently if we compared it to hospital spending. Absolutely. So having maybe that lens would also be helpful just to put it in perspective. Great, yeah, we can do that for next week. To add to that, Robin, were you asking for it as total NPR the hospital or total NPR they receive from the ACL? Well, I, I had been thinking about it as uh, total hospital spending, so, uh, but half, just because that mirrored like the previous slides, but I, I don't have a strong preference, so I Right, because I had written down, yeah. <laughs> I, I think um, having it both ways, just as a percentage of their total NPR, but also as a percentage of the NPR that they're, the FPP that they're getting from the ACL, because we see that will change for those hospitals that have more of their patient care being done outside of that hospital. It's a higher percentage. So we wanted to um, call to your attention that uh, one care's risk model has changed since FY19. Uh, so the founders are now assuming hospital-specific risk mitigation of approximately 3.8. Um, however, one care um, noted in their submission that they would like to retain the $4 million in reserves that were previously set aside for these specific hospital risk mitigation arrangements for general liquidity concerns. Um, we asked them to quantify this, but um, we did not receive any quantification of why this $4 million was the appropriate amount. Um, so we just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, so our recommendations here are that any further changes or developments to One Care's risk strategy must be documented and presented to the Dreamland Care Board. Um, and one care must notify the board upon its intended use of the $4 million in reserve, including the reason for drawing down the reserve, the use of, and, and in addition to that, the use of this reserve will be limited to population health investments and supporting participation of hospitals engaging in sustainability planning, um, unless otherwise approved by the board. This one would be new from last year. So finally, I think we'll talk about evaluation. We're almost there. Um, so evaluating all-pair model and the ACO is a vehicle for implementing um, the model. So under the all-pair model, um, Green Mountain Care Board reports on scale, cost, and quality, or total cost of care and quality um, through these um, specific um, deliverables outlined in, in the model. In addition to these required reports, um, staff at the board will leverage internal and external sources to dig into understanding incidents, trends, and scale, cost quality, and utilization. Um, so that being said, you know, through our ACO monitoring reporting, whether we um, get reports back from our payers, like we've just had this in these few, past few weeks, you know, results from 2018. Um, so we're going to be triangulating across a lot of different data sources and a lot of different inputs to kind of understand um, how we're doing as a state. Uh, so an example of some internal reporting that um, we have look, to look forward to um, is primary care spending um, by payer, and then we'll be looking at uh, the ACO uh, performance relative to the broader Vermont population. And we could go on and on there, but you know, we'll 
this for simplicity's sake, well, so our recommendations around evaluation, um, you know, while we will be doing internal reporting, we'd like to here to develop a performance dashboard <coughs> to be approved by the, um, to the board by the end of Q2, including implementation plan, and that implementation plan will outline kind of um, when we would expect to publish that performance dashboard. In addition, as I mentioned, you know, we have work going on at the board, but we wanted to memorialize our commitment to developing and publishing a dashboard comparing ACO to non-ACO or overall uh, Vermont performance. Um, and the dashboard should reflect current and actual trend data and analysis on the following um, <coughs> topics, quality utilization and total cost of care, attribution by payer, percent of fixed prospective payment versus fee for service, um, and other metrics tied to the all care model, and perhaps population health measures. So we're looking at other stakeholders in, in our Vermont state partners that um, we could work with to really make this a robust um, exercise. Can I, can I just ask a question? Okay. Certainly. Um, so maybe Melissa, you could just give us a very brief update on a, the federal evaluation so that we should understand there's the work that we're doing here at the state level. And I know you're mm -hmm. seeing that as uh, on the state side, but if you could just share with mm -hmm. the board and the public where we are on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Sam Amaya's hired the University of Chicago, um, NORC is their company name, and um, national, I'm not exactly sure what it stands for, I'm sorry, Kevin. <laughs> they, they want to go by NORC. They don't want to go by the full um, spelled out, so that is their name. <laughs> um, I think it's a national community research company or something like that. So um, they are doing the next generation evaluation as well for, uh, the, for CMS and have been hired by CMMI to do the all pair model evaluation. We've been working with them to um, set up the first year of their review. We've met with them. They will be doing um, a survey of providers, both ACO and non-ACO attributed, and are working with stakeholders to distribute that survey. As well, uh, we, will, we, are, we are waiting to find out when the final first evaluation will be published. Um, we, it's now sounding like late summer of 2020 due to data delays. So um, what we're finding I think in this model is that data is um, something that is not always expected as we would hope um, due to claim speeds and everything else. So we want the data to be right. Um, and uh, we'll be working with them in the uh, perpetuity of the model. And they have a very robust uh, plan for evaluating the healthcare model with a um, com comparable population. And as soon as the plan for evaluation becomes public, we plan on um, sharing that more broadly. Can I just ask a follow-up question that I don't expect you to be able to answer for North, but I'll put it out there so you can um, send it over to them. Uh, I, I think one question that will come up is how they're going to account for the uh, blueprint for health uh, impacts in the non-ACO attributed population, because the blueprint has a favorable evaluation showing savings compared to a control group. Um, and so I think that has to be factored in in some way because the ACO is required to build off of the blueprint. So we now have this kind of embedded <coughs> care coordination model that the ACO is working with and kind of integrated with. Um, Untangling that seems complicated, but I'm confident that North can figure it out. I just want to make sure that they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, we, they did provide their plan to us, which is still an internal working document, um, um, their internal working document, but they described the history of healthcare reform in Vermont and are definitely taking into consideration the formation of the blueprint and the SIM um, project in relation to where we are now with the Alpha model, um, but we'll, and we'll mention this as well. So like Prince, um, it's the National Opinion Research Center, okay. and they wish that to be the formally known as. Okay. Um, 
so here we just wanted to, um, you know, a lot of the recommendations we've seen today are similar but different than um, what we excuse me, proposed in the past. Uh, we would like to carry over some um, recommendations from 19 that we did not discuss explicitly. Um, and I'm just going to list them here. Some of them do overlap, but A through F, K, and M through S. So when we come back next week, we will have kind of specific, we will have reconciled those. We didn't have time to do that here, but we hope to in the future by this date have that more explicitly laid out. Um, so I think you know we'll be carrying forward a significant number of recommendations from, from prior year and just <coughs> um, to meet some of our, our new goals. <coughs> The link to the full 19 budget order for public consumption is on this slide. So um, we're back to summary um, of our recommendations. I won't read them again, but they'll be here in case we need to reference them in questions um, or conversation. Um, other recommendations we'd like to point to um, include just additional uh, deliverables we would like to see from one year. Um, expected hospital dues for 2020 by hospital, uh, 2020 population health management source of funds by payer um, by hospital, the hospital risk addendums, and then if um, funding, um, DSR or IPD funding um, are granted, what are their planned use? Um, and we expect this to be part of that um, conversation in Q1. Delivery system reform dollars and Robin, help me on IAPD. Uh, okay. Because well, your acronym It's the technology money from Medicaid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so next steps. Uh, so the board will vote on one per month's budget and one per benchmark growth, which is scheduled for next week. Uh, Green Mountain Care Board will then produce the FY 2020 budget order for uh, one care. Then staff will update our ACO monitoring plan. Um, Green Mountain Care Board staff will continue posting quarterly uh, ACO monitoring and reporting materials as we've done in the past. Um, and we expect, as Michelle mentioned earlier, for staff to present on all payer model quality results in early 2020. Um, One Care Vermont will then provide a final care contract, final attribution, and revised budget um, to the board by April 1st of 2020. Uh, then our first annual report on all your model will be published, people also said, end of uh, summer, but maybe fall 2020. And the Green Mountain Care Board staff will continue to update the board on development of ACO performance dashboards um, as that progresses. Um, and we will also keep in the loop on the Medicaid advisory rate case and the 2020 Medicare contract. Um, and we'll notify as soon as those are publicly available. Um, and in addition, staff will continue to meet regularly with the healthcare advocate, which has been very helpful in kind of finalizing our recommendations um, or this round of recommendations um, and identifying opportunities for <coughs> um, Regulatory integration. I think historically we've had this conversation. We were going to, um, because of time, kind of hope to have this in the future, uh, but there are certainly a lot of opportunities. I think we've alluded to them along the way in our presentation. Um, you know, Green Mountain Care Board staff have uh, already begun identifying process improvements and opportunities to link regulatory processes. I know there's you know, one paper that some of the board members and staff are working on actively. Um, and then we've also um, are looking forward to working with the healthcare advocate to further identify opportunities to link inputs and outputs between our regulatory processes. Um, and due to the depth of the content we have today, we won't go explicitly, but would love to come back and present more holistically on regulatory integration opportunities in the spring. So now we're ready for questions. You can take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> questions from the board. Tom. Let me roll through to the beginning here. Um, I think this is an easy one to answer, is that on uh, slide 19, uh, there is a, um, under the key criteria column, solvency and financial risk. I assume that just means ACO solvency and financial risk. Uh, the rule, yes, the rule is about a ACO. Uh, okay. Um, moving forward to um, slide, uh, 22. Um, I'm looking at the um, 
We try to put it up on yeah. the screen so that everybody can follow along. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> it's just gonna take it tricky because we have to go through all the classes to get back. Um, well, we got a long way back. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can finish. Well, I'll talk slowly while I ask my question. Can I use the computer? Yeah, on that slide, it has to do with certification eligibility verification. <coughs> And part of this is population health um, distribution procedure. And I'm just curious in terms of uh, that $43 million, um, is there any requirement that um, uh, a beneficiary of it provide matching funds? And the reason I, the reason I ask that is that I don't... Sorry, Tom, can you restate your question because we have a lot of technical... Okay. Um, in, the, in the distribution... Um, of the, uh, the $43 million in um, population health investments. Um, as I looked down the list, I saw attribution is kind of one, of one of the kind of drivers of that distribution. But I just want to know, I'm concerned that uh, it's not a level playing field out there among providers, and some can take more risk than others, and maybe even in engaging um, in these population health measures. And so if there's a matching requirement, uh, uh, and uh, a provider that would really benefit from these investments might decide not to engage it uh, just because of the matching requirements. So I'm just asking, do, do, does the ACO require a match, a financial commitment uh, to these investments? To the population, not to my knowledge, I don't know of any matching requirements. Thank you. Uh, our current analysis of the population health investments, it, comes, it falls into two major buckets. They are either payer right. dollars or hospital participation fee dollars. Okay. It's about 50 50. Um, turning to slide, looks like it's 26. And again, I can. <coughs> we'll talk slowly here. Um, this is under budget process, and we're looking at the, the broad categories. And one is the effects of Medicaid reimbursement on other payers. Um, but I didn't see any further discussion of that through the slide bank. And um, you know, I'm just of the view, as you know, that um, the payer mix and Medicaid cost shift are. You know, structurally flawed problems within the existing system. If you step back and say, you know, what would the landscape of healthcare look like, you know, if um, there was no cost shift, the payer mix was equitably distributed, if the benchmark <coughs> plan was up to date, um, and, the, and, and the hospital budget process led toward, you know, more um, um, level playing field in terms of the distribution of operating margin. So I'm wondering what the further thought is on, on this uh, bullet, which says effects of Medicaid reimbursement on other payers. Yeah, I think there are a number of ways we can look at that through other reporting mechanisms. Um, I think it's an ongoing conversation, and it might be right for regulatory integration. Um, but I think it, it, it comes up. Um, we also have the payer differential report under the all-payer model. Um, which is a, there's different uh, times at which this will be presented if we still working on that report on um, this year. Uh, the payer differential assessment will be first, and then there'll be a number of reports next year that will get at that in a little more detail. So I, I do worry, I mean, I am a supporter of I'm a supporter of the ACO, and I believe we're on the right track, but if there are these kind of structural imbalances that exist in the seams between Green Mountain Care Board and DIVA and the ACO, et cetera, um, I, I think it would be a, um, a mistake to kind of not address those and, and to find a path on which, which to address them. Um, looking at slide number 45, the provider network, um, or, or this whole section on provider networks. Um, I don't think, I just don't think it's um, accepted well enough out there that uh, this is a voluntary system. Um, and um, we have uh, uh, dozens and dozens of providers that are now engaged in this system and associated with each one of those providers or collectively with those providers are thousands and thousands of Vermonters sitting on hospital boards 
um, uh, on designated agency boards, et cetera, et cetera, trying to figure out on the front lines of healthcare, you know, what to do. And, um, and so when you kind of follow the money associated with that, you can see that these entities are kind of voting with their budgets, and, and, and these are budgets that, you know, are um, uh, embedded in these local HSA communities. Um, this is, you know, this is Vermont at its best uh, to a great extent. And so you follow the money and you have a uh, total revenue of the ACO at 634 million in 2018. 881.9 million uh, for 2019 projected, and 1.42 million for 2020 projected. Um, and uh, I, I, I just think it's important to note that that the, the providers that are engaged with the ACO are doing it on a voluntary basis. This money is their money, and it is sacred to them and to their operations. And uh, there's a lot of wisdom out there at the local level. Um, and I, I just think that looking at this list of providers and the growth that you're experiencing is something to be recognized and, underso and, and underscored in this process. saw at some point, I'm, I'm on slide uh, 77 now, um, I thought I saw at one point that there was a, um, a requirement or a calculation on showing that the net savings, of, you know, positive savings versus losses, the net of that kind of being a measure of, of the value of the administrative expense associated with the ACO. So, um, um, over time, uh, is that measure? In my, is my memory? You're, you're accurate, um, and that is one measure that we um, uh, proposed to carry forward from 2019. It's been there for a number of years. Um, the challenge with this measure is going to be about how we quantify, um, you know, some of these things that are really qualitative um, concepts. So. Um, foregone spending, there's really, if there's really no way to, well, I shouldn't say no way, it's very, very difficult to quantify um, something that has not happened. Mm -hmm. So if there's a lot of assumptions baked into there, so I think we need to, um, with, a, with a broader group of our stakeholders, really understand what it is that we're trying to um, understand and measure and, and what is a appropriate way of assessing um, value. Because I, I, I saw in one of the comments um, uh, to the board, you know, that, uh, you know, this, this is just an added burden of administrative expense. And I thought that was a fair question. Um, because in some degree it is. This is new. And it's, it, <coughs> and it's you know, it's a, um, you know, it's a, could be viewed as a burden on the system. But really, or it could be viewed as an investment on the system that we have this kind of loosely fit together infrastructure in healthcare in Vermont. And this is bringing efficiencies to that system, as well investments that make Vermonters healthier, so they don't need the system as much as they might. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just—I would support that comment that um, uh, we find a metric that basically uh, is simple and well and, and understandable that says, uh, yes, this system, the administrative costs of the ACO are of a value less than the savings that they're bringing to the system. Sure, and I think the challenge will be in identifying a metric. It might be a series of metrics or a metric in a conversation, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, the staff would um, hope the board would recognize that there are a lot of qualitative measures um, that are really important to consider when evaluating the, the value of this model broadly. And under my, my last uh, <coughs> kind of comment or question, arena is uh, on regulatory integration. I mean, as you know, uh, I, I just think that that's an important thing to do. Um, and, you know, the areas clearly are uh, having to do with payer mix, having to, to do with the cost shift, having to, to do with the benchmark plan, for example. I think in terms of the ACO, uh, looking at the benchmark plan, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield's 2018 expenditure on QHP, uh, um, um, or revenues in terms of QHP premiums was $340 million. 
that's about 25, 26, 27 percent of the ACO's entire budget, yet the QHP plan um, is dated back to 2014 before the all payer model. And so just up finding a process, a regulatory process to update these, to, to, to make things uh, move forward in sync um, is, uh, is I, th I, th I think, an important undertaking. My final observation has to do with um, <clears throat> a uh, condition that we put in the 2018 budget, I think, having to do with uh, asking the ACO to cooperate with the board to develop a path to, um, that moves any savings um, out of, uh, into uh, commercial insurers and into the pockets of ratepayers. And because there was no savings, um, it's a kind of a moot, it's a, I guess moot, M-O-O-T, moot uh, issue, um, and, and we've moved on. I, I think that this is an important issue to address in terms of looking at the relative balance of, say, operating margin between an insurer like Blue Cross Blue Shield and their ability to push money uh, downstream back into the pockets of ratepayers versus other parts of the system. And I'll just give you an example. Over the last four years, um, from 2015 to 2018, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, total premium revenue of, I've, I've got it here somewhere, um, of Blue Cross Blue Shield was um, $2.16 billion. It's a lot of money in, in terms of the healthcare system. And um, <clears throat> most of that got paid out in premiums, so their loss ratios are quite high, maybe too high. But, uh, but of that amount of revenue that came into their system, over that four-year period, they had two years where they had losses and two years where they had gains. And the cumulative value of that was a $3.4 million gain on $2.16 billion worth of premium. And I, I just don't see in that, in that scenario where there will be any reasonable expectation going forward that, um, that funds can be pushed back uh, to ratepayers, given the way the system operates now, it just doesn't work. Um, you look at another arena, you know, where uh, money in the healthcare system flows, and the UVM Medical Center is at the other end, <coughs> at the other end of the spectrum, where over that same four years, uh, <coughs> they've experienced 264 million um, in operating margin, and that's not total margin, that's operating margin, um, and which is 5.6 percent of their revenues. And I, I, um, I, 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 I think the, the, the expectation that was in that condition O is still valid. We need to find a way to solve some specific problems like the, Bennett, the premium cliff at 400% of poverty, which in my view is not a big problem to solve if people want to do it. Uh, but the more structural problem of how um, operating margins or the margins kind of move in this system so that um, the smaller hospitals uh, don't um, uh, run into the wall of solvency and ratepayers can truly say the system is working for them and it, and it means that their co-pays or their deductibles or their premiums are, are not trending as they have trended in the past. So that's kind of my hope for this regulatory um, uh, <coughs> alignment uh, that, you know, that, that, that you have here. I think we'll look forward to connecting all the dots across the processes um, when we can come back together this spring. I think you know there are a lot of layers between the ACO budget and the insurance rate review process that we have to um, understand more in a more nuanced way before we can make more precise recommendations. Um, so thank you for your comment. If I could just respond specifically on the regulatory integration as one of the board members who's been working on that. Uh, we've been focused on Green Mountain Care Board regulatory duties. And some of what you're talking about, Tom, is not a Green Mountain Care Board duty. And so uh, I just want to level set that we have not been looking outside of our own purview. Yeah. I mean, the benchmark plan yeah. is, but uh, in terms of... And rate review is. Yes, but yeah. creating a, a benefit program for people over 400% of poverty is not. That's a legislative <coughs> action. Uh, so I just want to be I just want to be transparent that it's not going to address all of the issues that I know are of concern to you. Yeah. 
Well, I, you know, I, my, my response is I probably disagree with you. I rarely do, but I probably disagree <laughs> with you here. You know, that we need to kind of look beyond our own walls um, to solve problems for folks. And, you know, when you look at somebody uh, at 401% of poverty whose uh, um, premium uh, at 399% of poverty would have been 3 to 4%, and they have 401 percent of poverty, and it's 14 or 15 percent. You know, uh, that's a problem. And um, and I'm, to be clear, I'm not saying it's not a problem. It's just not a problem that I can fix in regulatory integration. Well, but so. we might be. I mean, in, in terms of even looking at hospital budgets and how money moves in the system, we have a big impact on that. And uh, um, and I, I don't see the money in the system <coughs> moving toward. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield's bottom line, so they can turn to their ratepayers and say, we can lower the rates. I, I, it's just not, when you have four years of history and they've only got $3.4 million in net earnings out of, you know, billions of dollars in revenue, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, a dry, it's a dry well. So we have, we have to find a problem. I mean, we have, to, we have the problem. We have, we have to find a solution to have uh, the, the, the health care system be more responsive to the needs of people that are facing high premiums and co pays and deductibles. I would just add that I see Ina left, but. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, she's there. Oh, is she? Oh, she can't see her. She's my Robin. The legislature, le legislature just received a report um, regarding health, insur mar health insurance marketplace uh, issues and, and this issue of uh, premium subsidies was was addressed in there. I'm sure it will be an issue that's considered in the legislature this year, but as Robin said, like it's outside of our, outside of our purview, that, that specific issue. Okay, other board members. Um, sure. Uh, I just have a few questions. Um, page 27. I think on this one, um, it would be good to also show the offsetting income. I mean, you do show it for the million three sixty-two, but for the f population health investments and the admin expenses, you know, just where that's being generated by participation fees and grants and other areas. So I think to kind of round that chart would be good to balance both pieces of it. <coughs> and then on page eighty-three. Uh, just a couple things on this chart. One, just pointing out, and I know, you know, we're very concerned, obviously, about the risk that the that is generated from the system, but we don't want to forget that this is also potentially a saving side as well, and so that you know the court that this quarter kind of goes both ways, right? So there's a maximum risk of the 44.1 million, and there's a potential you know, savings of up to 44.1 million. To that point, I want to bring up and, and just kind of ask as a question, you know, when we talk about the admin costs of 19.3 million and putting in that ultimately the admin cost should be seen as a potential save in the system. And not that I don't want to see that, I, I do, but I've always had a bit of a concern on where we're going to see that, right? So really, this is the place, or one of the places we, in the short term that we'd need to see that, or am I wrong with that? Well, Ray, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think what um, uh, Board Member Pellen brought up earlier um, was about how do we quantify the, these savings. And I think you know, financial savings are just one piece of this puzzle. Um, there are also a lot of other, there's a lot of other value that's being created across the system that I think we need to think about how we quantify that that may not um, appear in sheer savings back to the, through this mechanism. Um, so I think, you know, while we will see that that is a significant portion of these real dollars, we just want to be cognizant that there might be other ways that we should quantify change to our overall healthcare system um, we don't want to ignore other benefits that we've created or other challenges um, that might not be quantifiable in the terms of dollars. So administrative burden being one of those things. How do you quantify administrative burden um, to, our, you know, to our system? So. 
and, and I agree with you. Um, my point is, you know, what, what are the expectations for that? Because, you know, in the black and white, it could be there's 19.3 million. We expect to see those savings through the right. system. And also because so much of this work really could depend on what's going to happen in the future, right? We're kind of laying groundwork for what could be happening, you know, three, four, five years down the road, 10 years down the road. So I just want to kind of put that in there because it's always been one of the requirements that we've had that I've had a concern with, not because I don't want to see that offsetting savings, but I don't think we've defined where it would come from. Absolutely. And I just want to be clear on that because, you know, on a black and white, you could say, well, we should see that savings here. And that's not, that's not what the expectations are. Okay. And then my last is on page 90. Um, and this may be something, you know, we'll go back with the ACL on. I, I guess a couple points on number two. First, the $4 million in reserves um, from a 2020 budget, um, fortunately, were, were built in 2019. So we're not seeing this impact of an incremental $4 million put into the budget in 2020. However, that said, I don't think that the ACO has clearly represented why they need this money, because when it was built up, at the 3.9 million requirement, it was to cover the hospitals that were being um, relieved of their risk assignment, if you will. So there were several hospitals that, you know, it said we would back, the ACO would back that 3.9 million. They didn't really bring up, except when we asked questions, that there's been a change and that the founders, um, Dartmouth and, UVM are now going to back those hospitals' risk, which which is fine. That, that's good, but that then you know the the need for that reserve had been for those specific reasons, and now to carry a four million dollar reserve without this step, you know, without what they're going to use it for. So I guess you know I'm, there's still so much uncertainty with the ACO. I'm okay to keep that in there. But we really, and I know you're putting as a requirement, are going to want to watch what are we spending this for? Because some of the things they came back with, um, liquidity risk of different areas, I mean, um, this, this reserve was built for a different reason. The 3.9 million that we built last year was built for a different reason. And we're not using that for that resource anymore. So I just want to be really clear about that. It can be something we follow up later. It doesn't impact the 2020 other than to say they could have let that flow back through the P&L and relieved some of the participation fees from the hospitals. And I know, you know, they're proving that through their system. But this was a little bit, took us a little bit off guard, I would say, on how it was handled. But. I think that's a great point. And I think the other thing we need to keep in mind, too, is we're going to the 19 and how this will actually shake out. So maybe we'll have more of an understanding in the spring. Okay. Thanks. Can I just ask you a question? Marie? Certainly. Are, are you satisfied with the condition on the next page that the staff is recommending around the monitoring? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to see that <coughs> your concern. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that message was heard <laughs> and um, understand, you know, of, of why we're saying that. It, it's It's not that we don't think there's potential risks in the system. This reserve was built for a different reason, and you know it, it, we, it's no longer needed for that specific reason. And to just say, well, we're just going to keep it, um, you know, it, there were some concerns about that. Should I go next? Sure. Okay. Um, so slide thirty. Um, so this is more of a comment on the provider reimbursement recommendation. I like that the monitoring of the percentage of provider payments that are fee for service versus fixed perspective payment, but I did want to make the comments that it was never anticipated that all providers would be under a fixed perspective payment, either because uh, it's a small provider that can assume risk, or it's perhaps the type of um, 
service that you're not really worried about volume increasing because that would be an appropriate uh, utilization. So I, I just wanted to say that out loud and have you guys keep that in mind as, as we're doing this monitoring because I think there's a tendency to, to assume that fixed perspective payment is the way to go for all providers and I don't think that's actually the case. So uh, particularly when you're talking about a system where there's a total cost of care look and accountability at that level uh, as well as at the fixed perspective payment level. So uh, I just wanted to really make that comment and so that you can be thinking about that as we move forward. Um, On um, slide 33, it, it just raised the issue for me. Uh, the HCA and their recommendations had suggested doing a deadline for payer contracts. Um, and while I would love to see the payer contracts finalized before uh, December, I don't actually think it's realistic given where we currently are with scale because I think that um, until we get to a more stable population, the data and the numbers are going to require a lot of uh, careful attention. And I think that's part of what is driving some of the delays in, for example, the Medicaid rate case, uh, as well as uh, the shift, for example, to geographic attribution. And so I, I don't want to create a deadline that's going to result in less careful attention to the data. Um, and quite frankly, I don't know how we couldn't enforce it against Medicaid, for example. So um, uh, while I, I love the idea of it, I don't think it's actually practical at this point in the model to do that. So uh, I just wanted to make that comment so that you would understand my thinking around that. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the commercial QHP, benchmark um, recommendation. I, I like carrying over the recommendations from the 2019 budget. Um, I guess this would really probably be slide 41. Um, and uh, while it's somewhat dissatisfying reviewing the budget without final information, I think that particularly in the QHP Area, I don't think that's going to improve given the federal rules for exchanges around grace periods and, and premium payment by customers, which really means that the attribution in that population can't be finalized until the end of January. So uh, uh, it, it is dissatisfying, but I think that this process that we set up last year where we finalize the numbers and take a, a deeper look into the payer contracts uh, in the spring makes a lot of sense when we have final numbers. So uh, I'm glad you carried that forward. Um, I would, however, like to see the underlying data that the One Care received from the payers, understanding that that there would probably come with a confidentiality request uh, from both the payers and One Care. Um, and uh, but I think it's important for us to see that background data for you guys to be able to analyze that and also for our regulatory integration with rate review. So that would be a request. Um, I don't know if it needs to be a budget condition, but uh, I just put that out there. Um, the, the next topic that I wanted to talk about a little bit is um, slide 59 because uh, to Ham's earlier point about the lack of understanding of the uh, financial step, I think there's a similar <coughs> lack of understanding around the ACO's role in the community and the governance structure for the community collaboratives, um, which quite frankly I think is confusing given that we have this system that we built up around the blueprint for health. And so um, I just wanted to say out loud that the blue, we don't regulate the blueprint for health. The blueprint for health has a statutory governance structure that would need to be changed by the legislature for us to dictate um, requirements onto those community collaboratives, even I think through the ACO. Uh, because if the ACO, for example, is not in charge of the community collaboratives. That is something that's done through the blueprint. Uh, that, 
that's, I think it makes a lot of, to Tom's point, like one of the things about Vermont is that we like to do things on a more local level. And so we want the communities to be able to make their own judgments and assessments around their own priorities because they're a lot closer to the patients than we are sitting here in Montpelier. But what that also means is that uh, because the blueprint has created a system where the communities are in charge and, the, and there's not a lot of top-down dictation from either the state or uh, the ACO about what those priorities should be or must be, uh, I think that's something that we need to respect. That does mean it's, uh, it's harder to see the alignment necessarily at the very highest level with the APM goals. So that's something that I think we should, particularly if we aren't <coughs> seeing results that we would like to see, that's, some, that's a conversation that should happen. I do think it's bigger than us. I think as this shows, it's a conversation that has to happen with the blueprint and uh, all the payers. And I'd love to see some of the communities involved also uh, talk about that. Because I think one of the complaints at the community level is administrative burden. And when we talk about adding uh, requirements that basically flow down to those communities, we should understand that that's what we're doing and uh, understand the burden on those communities. So uh, I don't have a, a recommendation that I want to propose to this uh, other than maybe it's a conversation that we could uh, broach with the blue <coughs> for a future informational session in the spring or something like that. Um, I did have a question about uh, your recommendation 12, which is on page 65, um, about the work plan <coughs> related to what I just said. So uh, when we look at the list of population health investments, it includes Blueprint and SASH. Uh, presumably, we are not going to require the, the one care to do a work plan for Blueprint and SASH, given that we don't have authority over Blueprint and SASH, and uh, they have their own governance structure. So I don't think that's what you intended, but I think we need to clean up that language to make it a little more clear about what it should and shouldn't apply to. Because in addition, as you may note earlier, and again, going back to Tom's point that this is a provider-led voluntary <coughs> model, we are not designing the payer programs. The payers are designing the payer programs. From a regulatory standpoint, we are look, reviewing those for alignment and other consistencies uh, with the all-payer model. Uh, but I, I, so I think that we need to just be a little more specific in 12 so that it's clear what, we're, what we think we need the work plan for and what uh, is somebody else's responsibility. Thank you. We'll make that change. Um. I was just going to add, Robin, I think a lot of your comments speak to some work that we are um, trying to produce as staff and, and understanding this governance relationship across the broader system, which yeah. is why we brought some of these um, kind of slide, history slides, right? Because I think there we need to get clear on roles and responsibilities um, to make sure that you know we're looking at the right things and. and going the right avenue given uh, the broader context. So that is something that we will be working on and throughout the next year. We will try to incorporate that into our presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's helpful. And it, it is complicated because we did require that the ACO not duplicate mm -hmm. uh, the, the blueprint. So the blueprint and the ACO need to be working hand in glove. The, the negative, or I don't even know if it's really a negative, but the challenge of that is that you then can't really separate mm -hmm. Like, it's hard to tell where one stops and the other starts. Mm -hmm. So, um, right, exactly, which is why we thought the work plan would be helpful to delineate those activities that Wonder is responsible for um, assessing with their dollar amounts versus the money that goes through them to the evidence based program that is the blueprint that they are required to coordinate with and not duplicate. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, and one other thing about that, uh, that that is a question. So when we, you had talked about, when you were talking about that, the new care coordination model, which I don't know if I have the slide there. Hold on. Oh, slide 64, yeah. The <coughs> new um, complex care coordination program. Um, 
You had mentioned that one of the rationales that we had heard in terms of the shift was that the previous amounts weren't sufficient to support the need for care coordinators on the ground. It's my understanding, but please correct me if I'm wrong, those care coordinators are not hired by one care. That is definitely correct. They're hired by <coughs> the agencies listed above, um, but the existing primary care, home health, and designated agencies. Thank you. Um, and then my only other, uh, it's really more a comment, uh, is just to reiterate, um, when we're looking, so when Michelle was talking about the quality uh, results and how we're going to try and track uh, ACO versus non-ACO, I think at the minimum there needs to be, to be a big disclaimer about the blueprint there because the blueprints activities are going to have impacts on the quality results on a statewide basis. <coughs> So, and those will be captured in the non-ACO area. So just yes. let's keep that in mind when we're Yeah, which goes <laughs> back to the concept of the, of the Ultra Model Dashboard or other ways that we're publicly reporting, working with stakeholders to determine the best way to track outcomes and measure change. And that's what I had. Thank you, Robin. Jess? Come to the end here. <laughs> um, so first of all, I want to thank you because I know how much work you and the team, all of you, have been doing and those other staff behind the scenes at the board. So it's very appreciated um, and, and probably not recognized enough. Actually, in relation to that, I was curious. Um, you know, you've been to conferences, you've been to other states, you've been involved in, you know, these kinds of efforts, uh, learning about these kinds of efforts in other states. Do you have a sense, my sense is this ACO is probably the most heavily regulated, has more oversight <coughs> than most other ACOs in the country. Do you have a sense of just of that put into perspective? I'm just curious, because I'm thinking um, about all these. Yeah, no, we do have a sense of that. There definitely is not consistency in ACO regulation throughout the country. Um, we um, have been working with the national contractor off and on, you said that we have one of them one of, if not the most heavily ACO-regulated state in the country. Um, yeah. um, so I wanted to, uh, thank you, I just yeah. wanted to hear that. I thought that was probably true, and I wanted to hear that from you all. So um, I wanted to just comment on a couple of the uh, recommendations. I know the, there's so much here, and I have to digest them over the next week, and, and I appreciate them very much. Um, I want to echo Robin's point about uh, the recommendation around the trend for the commercial rate. I think having a little more information to inform us on how that trend analysis was constructed uh, in the commercial population I think is really important. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the network development strategy recommendations, particularly uh, combined with the scale target memo follow-up items. You know, I think that the, that one care has a very large role to play in helping the state achieve scale. Um, it's not the only player in helping us achieve scale as a state, but it's a large player. To the extent that, yes, this is a voluntary program, but the ACO has to develop the programs that are going to be attractive to payers and providers. And so I think understanding their outreach strategy, understanding why providers may be dropping out is really important. So I really appreciated that recommendation. Uh, along with the, the, the follow-up one about the st scale target memo. Um, I, wanna, I also wanted to say I appreciated the uh, recommendations around the population health investments and having those be reported by HSA and in those areas where One Care Vermont has some discretion around those population health investments, those community-specific population health <coughs> investments, tying those, they're doing a lot of data analysis on cost and quality differences across HSAs. And I would really like those investments then to be tied to what they're seeing in terms of the variations in, in cost and care. Those are really important. Making sure those investments are evidence-based, that they're assessed for those potential impacts, and that they're tracked. So I really appreciated that. Um, I wanted to also perhaps add an, uh, to recommendation 13. This complex care coordination program, One Care is proposing a pretty significant increase in the investment in those care dollars. And I think it is really important to do a mid-year update. And uh, you know, obviously next year we're gonna hear, want to hear even more about it. One of the pieces I would like to hear more about in particular, and have the ACO have a way to assess this, I wanna hear about patient satisfaction. 
So I, I would like to see some way in which the ACO is able to develop a mechanism to assess the, you know, the degree to which these patients, these <coughs> high-risk patients, uh, are benefiting from increased care coordination. So, you know, we need to talk about patients uh, in this model as well, and I think that's an area where we can do that. Um, and I just wanted to echo Maureen's concerns about the $4 million, uh, the reserve, and understanding why they still need that, given that the founders are now backing uh, the risk. And so I think this is 16 is a very important recommendation. Um, so I just wanted to echo that as well. And I very much appreciated the attempt to build a dashboard, a performance dashboard, to be comparing attributed lives to non-attributed lives and really understanding what's working here. So that's sort of my overall comments, but mostly thank you for all your hard work. The beauty about going last is that most of it's already been done before you. So I just want to uh, say that I think the most important part of your recommendations are the multitude of dashboards that will be created. And given the, um, what I would call high level of skepticism by the community at large, wherever possible in the creation of the dashboards, if in addition to self-reporting, we can have independent verification, um, that would be the most successful uh, dashboard that's there. And um, trying to utilize information that's coming from independent parties, I think, uh, will mean a lot to assure the public that um, the information that they're seeing is accurate. Uh, so. I just want to thank you again, and at this time I'm going to open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Yes, sir, in the back. Hey, uh, first of all, I want to thank the presenters. Uh, it makes me want to go to the Dartmouth program and stop doing what I'm doing. Um, I speak as a, both as an independent physician and as a rate payer. And uh, metrics for health care, I think you could go very granular and just say, metrics I'm concerned with is my monthly premium. Metrics I'm concerned as a provider is the sustainability of independent practices and our ability as independent practitioners to keep healthcare costs down. Uh, going up to the 150,000 foot level, though, the questions I have is why? Why is an ACO different than the HMO with Ira Magsinger and Hillary Clinton in the 1990s? Why should this work any better than it did then? Uh, and the next question is. I would feel much more comfortable if this were not under the rubric of UBM and a for-profit. Any savings that generated from this, I think if the public were made aware that those are going back into decreasing rates, as, Dr. as Mr. Pelham said, would make me much less of a skeptic of which I am. I, I, it's just tawdry to think of a for-profit venture in the state of Vermont. I left Massachusetts because a for-profit hospital situation came in Stewart move up to Vermont, and then I find a for-profit corporate behemoth up here, which is very disconcerting because healthcare is to benefit Vermonters, not to benefit the pockets of the bureaucrats that support healthcare. Well, I would just say that I cringe every time I hear the word for-profit linked to One Care Vermont because it's government regulation that really is requiring them to be for profit as far as if you want to have a board of managers that is truly um, representative of you and other people um, that are delivering care in the state um, they're kind of boxed into that and it's it's not like um, there are shareholders that are walking away with dollars from from this uh, process so um. And I would say that is the way that it's different from an MCO is that the the board of managers are providers. Yeah. So this is just a, a comment, Kevin, that, that gets to probably to your points, but also my belief that the whole environment is filled with <coughs> wild mistakes. It's misinformation and so forth. So I would just say one of the major questions in all of that is whether the healthcare reform project in Vermont has saved, has actually done anything. 
has it saved any money? Here's what I would say, and my comment goes to that point. If you look at the inflation rate in the hot school system from the year 2001 <coughs> to the year 2009, the annual inflation rate is 8.0%. If you then look at 10, 11, and 12, those were not regulatory years. One was the outcome, the result was the outcome of the 2008 uh, recession, and the 10 and 11 budgets were driven by actual legislative action. So if you now like look at 20, so the first regulatory, uh, new regulatory um, budget was 2013. If you look at, take the budget from 2013 <coughs> until 2020, the annual, the inflation rate, the average inflation rate per year in there is 3.9. Okay, so you've got a difference between the inflation rate in the aughts and the inflation rate under the uh, <coughs> rule, if you will, or whatever you want to call it, this board was uh, just under half of that. If you turn that into money, in other words, if you take the start the going in budget in 20, 2013 and you apply that rate, the rate that obtained in the aughts, that is to say 8%, the difference between that and what actually happened uh, was hundreds of millions of dollars if you compound it, then it comes almost to $2 billion. So the statement that nothing has been done, in my opinion, gro grossly false. That doesn't mean that there's not a long way to go. There is, okay. But to say that nothing is happening, that's garbage. I'd I, I like to put, the, I put garbage in the record if you think we don't. <laughs> Other public comments or questions? Yes, Susan. Um, Mr. first of all, thank you to you and your staff for all the tremendous work that's gone into this. I just want to respond to uh, what you just said about the for-profit nature of um, One Care. And I just want to say, it really surprised me, Mr. Chair, when you wrote your letter to the governor requesting Medicaid funding to go into the model or into the hospitals without that issue ever having come before the board, <coughs> there being any kind of vote or deliberation. But I bring that up in connection to the for-profit issue for the simple reason. There's just one place and one place only, well, maybe other places, but there's one key place where the for-profit nature of one care's ownership matters. And that is in terms of how the state decides to allocate its precious Medicaid resources. So as you know from your time in the legislature, there are certain things in the state that only Medicaid pays for, long-term care for instance, nursing homes, Services for people with disabilities. Only Medicaid pays for that. Medicare doesn't pay for it except rehab stays. Blue Cross doesn't pay for it except right after an accident or something like that. So to do, when the legislature decides where to give our Medicaid money, I hope that one of the things they consider is who needs it and why do they need it. And the key difference between a for-profit and a not-for-profit in this regard is that One Care is owned by two primary investors, Dartmouth Hitchcock and University <coughs> of Vermont Medical Center. And each of those entities, nonprofits as they are, each in their own right had significant overages. I think 70 million and 40 million. Profit over operating the margin, <coughs> you guys phrase that. So they own One Care. If they put money into One Care as investors, they get to get that money back out. The state puts Medicaid into One Care. The state doesn't get that money back out. So why does it matter that One Care is a for-profit owned by investors? That's why it matters. Investors can invest. Investors can get paid back out. That's the key difference. A normal nonprofit can't pay back investors. One Care can, and that's probably what will happen. And so when, it, when legislators, and I don't know if there are any legislators here today, but when they consider your request about Medicaid money, I hope they look at what other funding sources <coughs> all of the, the Medicaid funded programs have available to them. The designated agencies, home health, they don't have that investment structure that one care is fortunate to have. So why those of us like myself who care about Medicaid funded services bring up that one care is a for profit, that's why. 
And I would just one comment on the go DSR ahead. funds and the availability. There's sure. one of the two categories for DSR funds uh, would actually go to designated agencies to focus on mental health. So uh, I think investing in DSR funds is, doesn't necessarily, like there are multiple ways to do that um, to address uh, different issues. So that was just a point I wanted to clarify. Sorry, Kevin. No, that, that's fine. I, I don't want to get into a public debate on um, this, but I can just just want to say that many nonprofits are <laughs> nonprofits, but they're less efficient because money can be paid to different contracts or to um, salaries and things like that. And they may not be as regulated, for example, as one care is, where they would have to put their budget before a state body to, to uh, have it approved. And um, I think that one care was put into a box, and I don't think it was a conscious decision to be a for profit company. <coughs> I think that they were boxed in by government regulation, and that's where we are today. And, you know, we can debate this um, from noon till Sunday, but we're probably still going to end up on the same <coughs> position at the end of the day. Other public comment? Mike? Um, good afternoon. Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Um, we submitted a set of comments, and, uh, don't, and there's no reason for me to repeat anything that was submitted in, in our comments, but there's one, one issue that I do want to just raise recognize that it's not in our comments um, and that's uh, recognition that um, you know this this has been repeated a number of times today that that this reform effort is a, uh, a coalition of the willing and that is that phrase has often been used I think mostly to describe uh, providers um, but I do want to say out loud that I think it also should apply to um, to payers uh, including um, uh, self, small, including self-funded payers, uh, that uh, we believe that uh, the um, that that um, small self-funded that self-funded payers should have an opportunity to understand the pros and the cons, and be able to make a decision about participation uh, in this um, in one care. Um, and then I also just want to say out loud that uh, I really appreciate the, the work, uh, the, both the work that's behind the presentation that happened today and also ongoing work um, from uh, board staff uh, with the Healthcare Advocates Office. I think uh, we've come a long ways and um, th this has been a, a really good process. I look forward to replicating. Thank you, Mike. And I just want to publicly thank you because uh, um, in reading your submissions, um, it truly validates where we were coming to as a board to begin with as far as trying to make the, the staff recommendations. And so um, I thought that your uh, submissions were very, very well thought out. And uh, I thank you for that because it helped us tremendously. <coughs> Other public comment? Oh, go ahead, Dale. I'm sorry, didn't you're kind of hidden behind the camera to me. <laughs> I'd like to revisit one care, but just more for clarity. If it's really a question of who sits on the board of one care, and what is that percentage of who's on the board, is it 49% that has financial interest, or is it a question of 75% of its board includes provider representatives? And when you look at the board of One Care, and I have recently, I had this question in mind, and I thought of it as Mike was saying what he was saying. And some others were saying what they were saying. I didn't see a lot of consumer representation. Then again, I had a nurse that I think was 
the Medicaid representative, I had a commercial representative that was food bank or food oriented. Medicare was population health. That was the consumer representation on the board. All three of those are, interestingly enough, places that one care wants to turn a profit or wants to turn a savings. This gets into a very gray area. So I actually wasn't going to say anything today, but after hearing some, because I had these thoughts as I was looking at that board structure. How do I determine what is what? A am I just after quality of care at better cost? Or is it, in a sense, more a profit? And if there is a problem with the delivery of the care, certain people are being left out, certain populations are being left out. Who on that board is going to call that out? I can address the board sure. composition issue. So um, our certification rule that um, the team was discussing has requirements in there about um, consumer representatives. In here. Our, our, the rule that um, our team was talking about has requirements in there about uh, numbers of consumer representatives on the ACO's board of managers. Um, so there should be <coughs> consumer representation uh, on the board of managers. And in addition, uh, the rule requires an ACO to have a essentially a consumer advisory board that provides input to the board of managers. And so there's uh, input in, uh, from consumers in that respect as well. I don't know if the team wants to talk more about that, but that's my recollection. So it's under the governing body section of the rule 5.202. Uh, the <clears throat> ACO must have a government structure that reasonably and equitably represents ACO participants, including a governing body over which at least 75% control is held by ACO participants or representative of ACO participants. Um, to your point specifically, Dale uh, must include enrollee members, so at least one enrollee member who is a Medicare beneficiary, at least one enrollee member who is a Medicaid <coughs> beneficiary. Um, and enrollee members for commercial insurers that have um, a market share of at least five percent, and then there are there's representation on the consumer boards, as I mentioned. Does that answer your question, Dale? Not totally. The question would be not that all three of these aren't appropriate members. But if it's public health specifically as the consumer, if it's food bank specifically as the consumer, is there a special interest on the part of the consumer beyond that of looking out for the consumer? I especially want to look out for <clears throat> that their investment in food gives a savings. I especially want to make sure population health is really going to work. That's where I end up with the conflict. I can't tell. Yeah, no, I think that that's understandable. I think that the reason or the intent to have someone from the food bank as a representative is because food is such an important social determinant of health. It is not my understanding that they do fund the Vermont Food Bank. Um, the Vermont Food Bank has their own priorities and work with communities to distribute food for those communities. And I would add they also have a number of additional committees with stakeholders on them that are not only representatives as participants on the ACO. 
Matt, I think this gets back to the broader issue that we could do a better job of clarifying roles and responsibilities across all the parties. I think, you know, I, I just went to the board, um, you know, last summer, you know, the world of um, <laughs> but I, you know, it, it takes a long time to figure out how those relationships all work, and I, I think we can do a better job at the board of, of describing the, the governance structures and who has the dollars and who has the ownership. And I think um, you know that is kind of our biggest takeaway as we move forward is to help clarify some of some of that confusion. Yeah. Other yes. I, I have just one question because I, I hate to, on this for-profit one care, uh, am I incorrect in assuming that if, if there is a profit, that the profit would flow directly to Dartmouth and UVM, and so, that would fall into their non-profit bottom line? Is that an incorrect assumption, or is that, or what is the fact? I, I, in the 2020 budget, there is no projected profit. So all the dollars, have to go are either for, as we started with this budget process, for claims, for administrative expenses, so salaries, contracts, software, rent, supplies, um, or for population health investments. Um, so I think, you know, if, if there is a concern about profit, I think the staff would have no issue um, adding a recommendation that said, you know, if, if there is any change to estimates um, for the reserves or would it go back to the network, um, if there are any savings, but there are policies and procedures held at one here that um, identify how those savings um, or losses should be distributed amongst its members. Um, but I just want to highlight for everyone that, that there is no profit um, projected in the 2020 budget. But you know, to call many of these concerns, I don't think the staff would have a problem. You know, that's the board. Um, you know, suggesting a recommendation around um, that concern. And, and to back that up further, Bob, I just want to say that not only would we have the one care budget as an, the board having oversight over, but we would also be able to see that in the UVM budget. If it were to flow to them, we could then do a corresponding reduction in um, uh, a rate increase that they would be seeking. So um, there's a lot of checks and balances on, you know, I don't think that um, any, anybody's going to be walking away with the millions no. of dollars here. I just, I just hadn't, hadn't heard that said anywhere, you know, that the, that the flow would, if there was a profit, even though there's not, it would go to the, the, the two UVM and Dartmouth, and, th and those are regulated nonprofits, and that would be absorbed in their funds as some positive, which would pay for something internally, or maybe reduce their rates if everybody, you know, if it wouldn't be successful. Yeah. yeah, I just want to add one thing about um, how they would be able to generate profit. I mean, first, one of the things I asked the team to do was to put on that chart where the um, offsetting income was coming from. So if you assume, first of all, the largest income piece is from the three payers, um, and that gets paid out to the hospitals, the ACO doesn't get to keep that. The rest of their income comes from grants or from the hospitals. So the hospitals pay a participation fee, so it's kind of this cycle of where would they get a, a profit from. You know, they're basically, as we've said, they're an expense generator, so they're, they're, the part that they're doing is administrative expense. And then these grants that go out, so if they got, or these, um, the coordinated care payments that go out. So there's not really a place for them to generate profits from the payer stream. It would really be coming, I think, from participation fees. And they have, for 2019 as well, had a break-even budget. For 2020, a break-even budget. <coughs> but to that point, if they came in and said, we're going to make $4 million this year, I think not only would we have concern about that, but the majority of their board is representative of the hospitals that are on there that aren't necessarily the hospitals that are the owners, and they'd be paying for that because they're paying the participation fees. So, I mean, I, I think we certainly can put something in, but I just think from a monitoring, how would they get a profit? You know, assuming they have to disperse all the payer, the, what comes in from the payer streams from Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial, that goes out, right? Then 
the rest of it is coming from either grants or the hospitals themselves. So it's kind of a little bit of a circular argument, I think. But yes. This is the whole thing we're talking about, about the risk, the $44 million of risk that's in the, the P&L for 2020. That risk is borne by the hospitals. And the reward is borne by the hospitals, too, if there's a favorability. That doesn't roll back through to the ACO. That's why I'm saying, you know, where are they going to get this profit? That's, that's part of the biggest risk piece of this is how, how that gets paid out and how that gets reserved. And the hospitals are on the hook for that amount not it passes through the ACO so yes they're signers on things but they pass that through to the hospitals so we wouldn't expect to see the eight million dollar payment from one year in either 2019 reconciliation or 2020 that's all accounted for in their co payer contract in their provider contracts again my final thing about the nonprofit it's not that I expect no, I think you would profit. expect to see a payment uh, but then the revenue, the revenue for that offset. payment comes from the hospital, so it's offset. All right. The, the issue really is just that when you're deciding, if you're a legislator, where to put your Medicaid money, you might consider what other resources the, the intended beneficiary has available to them. And a for-profit with big investors has different resources available to them than a home health agency, a designated agency, or a nursing home. So it's just, it's, it's just something that legislators would want to know. That's what makes their ownership relevant. It doesn't mean that they're going to earn a profit. They do have different salary structures than, you know, other, than the other Medicaid-funded providers, but that's not about their profit or nonprofit status. UVM and Dartmouth have the same salary structures and they're nonprofit. So it has nothing to do with, that's not the nonprofit cost issue. It's just in terms of deciding how to spend money. And those are very hard decisions that legislators will have to make. But if they're concerned about the rising cost of health care and the quality of health care in the state of Vermont, they have to consider that as part of their considerations as well. Yes, Dale. This is, again, just for clarification, because we've actually discussed this before. The one issue that came up that I've given thought to is is the solvency issue if you're going to take on risk you got to have something that balances that out that showed up as a solvency issue in terms of reserves to cover risk taken if it's adverse in effect is it possible for a hospital to include a charge to build up reserves and to have it in a law where it's expressly stated it's a percent for reserves that is only to be used in covering risk related to the ACO or and this is where I know this is going to sprawl if it's even possible this will not be an easy debate in terms of what to do with it but we do need to do something if we <coughs> expect the downside risk to be accepted we got to allow the tools to be able to accept the risk. And we need, a dis we need a distribution of that cost 
in such a way that all of us are contributing as long as it's a non-profit hospital so that nobody is getting overburdened with that cost. Because I am concerned about if the solvency issue becomes crucial, who's going to end up paying that cost? And in the end, it could be what population or from where do you extract? And you see this all the time. If I'm not losing you, you I hope I'm not. Um, it, it's a really important question. The end comment. It is a very important question, and, and uh, it's been a barrier for participation in the past as well. And you know, so those conversations are going to continue. Okay. And Dale, there was a chart in the presentation that shows where the forty-four million dollars of risk sits, what hospital it sits at, and some of the things we are asking to add to that chart. What Robin had asked for is a percentage of total. Of their total revenue and as a percentage of their revenue they receive from one care you know would also be on there um, so you know it is out there as far as how much risk each hospital is taking and then those hospitals that really had the most issues maybe affording the ability to carry that risk those are being backed by UVM and Dartmouth to cover that should the worst case happen, right, which is they, they hit 100% of the downside risk. And to hit 100% of the downside risk, they'd have to miss, if they're, if they're receiving all three payer types, they'd have to miss on Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial, you know, across the system. So there's definitely risk out there, and we're still, you know, we haven't come up with what's the best process for each hospital to provide for that risk. Um, on the optimistic side, right, there's also potential savings, right? So if you said that, you know, what they're given is right down the middle of what should occur in that hospital, they have equal amount of risk or reward or savings on the other side. So, it, and, and whether every year you'd end up hitting this downside risk. So it's, it's certainly a big issue and it has been you know, a barrier for potentially people to enter until we get more years of information behind it. But, but it is spread across, and obviously UVM has almost half of the risk, the UVM network of the total, and then some of it's protected by reinsurance. So, you know, there are numbers out there about that. If I can just add to that, that was what came through in the survey that was done this summer about some of the obstacles to joining the ACO was how that risk sharing was uh, occurring. And so one of the reasons I think this is a good recommendation is number eight, having one care report formally on the status of their uh, movement towards reimagining that risk sharing because that's something that they had committed to doing was thinking differently about how they shared risk across hospitals, particularly thinking differently about critical access hospitals. and and their abilities to take on risk. And so we know it's a, it's, a, it's a longer process than perhaps they were ready for for the 2020, but you know this is something that they are considering and we want to hear more about what their strategies are. So. Thank you. Okay, other public comment or questions? If not, thank you, team. Um, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, so, so moved. moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you.